Silakan kerusi di ruangan tengah. Terima kasih. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to start the program. Alhamdulillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Let us begin the opening ceremony of the executive talks of the Kelantan tour for Dr. Zakir Naik with the recitation of the Ummul Kitab Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Rabbana subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana Innaka antal alimul hakim Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-alil azim Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasrili amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqaw qali Asbahna wa asbahal mulku lillah Walhamdulillah la sharika lah لا إله إلا هو إليه النشور أما بعد يا بحرمة داتو هجي محمد أمار بن عبد الله the deputy chief minister of Kelantan يا بحرمة داتو هجي عبد الله بن يعقوب the Kelantan state legislative assembly speaker Yang berhormat Ali-Ali Majlis Mesyuarat Kerajaan Negeri Kelantan Ali-Ali yang berhormat Yang Mulia Dato' Doktor Tunku Muhammad Fazih Harudin bin Tunku Faisal Tunku Kaya Perkasa Representing the Kelantan State Secretary The Right Honourable and the Most Welcome Brother Dr. Zakir Naik All Distinguished Head of States and Federal Governments, all government servants at all levels, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah, my gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His blessings and may peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that has made us to be here today on the 7th of Zulhijjah at Dewan Jaman Utama, Kota Darul Naim, to welcome the world-class Islamic speaker, the Honorable Dr. Zakir Naik, despite of having many invitations from all over the world. We are truly honored, we are truly honored, ladies and gentlemen, to have our beloved brother, Dr. Zakir Naik, to be here in Kelantan for the Kelantan tour, the first ever appearance of him in Kelantan Darul Naim. Thank you very much, Dr. Inshallah, this executive talks will enhance our knowledge and will gain more our concern about Islam in a true and a very clear perspective, inshallah. Ladies and gentlemen, for the welcoming speech, I would like to welcome Yang Bahormat, Dr. Haji Muhammad Amar bin Abdullah, the Chief, Deputy Chief Minister of Kelantan, to give a welcoming speech. I present to you, Dr. Haji Muhammad Amar, please welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahu wa wala Mr. Chairman <coughs> The Honorable Dato' Abdullah bin Yaakob Speaker of the, of the State Legislative Assembly State Ex Executive Councillors Deputy State Secretary, the Honorable Teku Kaya Perkasa, <coughs> members of Parliament, members of State uh, Legislative Assembly, uh, our respected and special guests for this special occasion, the Honorable Dr. Zakir Naik. First of all, I would like to express our gratitude to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala 
for His mercy and blessings for us, which enable us to come together this morning in this beautiful and elegant hall to hear the speech which be delivered by our respected guest, Dr. Zakir Naik. On behalf of the people of Kelantan, I would like to say welcome to our honourable guest, Selamat Dateh, uh, and enjoy yourself in this uh, state. Uh, I was informed that this is uh, the first time for Dr. Zakir Naik to visit our state, although he has been in this country for many, many years. So we hope that this is not the first and the last visit. Uh, we shall meet again in the future many, many times as brothers in Islam. The state of Kelantan uh, expressed our strong support and solidarity, solidarity to our guests, especially in facing the challenge and also the tribulations which is uh, uh, showed by those who are not easy and not feel easy and comfort with uh, our respected uh, guests. Ladies and gentlemen, kecek kelate pula lah. Payuh kecek putih ni. Tak habis maksud orang kata. Eh? So, I seek your permission to address our fellow brothers in one of the special language in in the world, Kelantan language. Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan semua, datuk-datuk, datuk-datuk, kita merasa gembira eh, kerana diberikan peluang dapat bersama-sama dengan Dr. Zakir Naik. Dan saya sendiri ini kali pertama. Saya bertemu secara uh, berdepan dengan Dr. Zakir Naik. Selama ini hanya melihat di dalam video YouTube dan juga membaca dalam tulisan-tulisan. Dan hari ini kita bertuah di Kelantan ini kerana diberikan peluang oleh Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Program ini dibuat ialah nombor satu sekali ialah kerana menyatakan sokongan kita yang tidak berbelah bagi. Kerana kita tahu suasana yang dihadapi oleh Dr Zakir Naik yang diserang dan uh, cuba dijatuhkan imej ya oleh mereka yang tidak suka dengan uh, pencapaian dan juga kebolehan dia dalam menjelaskan Islam kepada masyarakat di dunia. Dan ini merupakan perkara biasa bagi musuh-musuh Islam bila mereka tidak dapat berdepan maka mereka akan mencari jalan yang tidak bermaruah untuk menghalang penyebaran agama ini. Kita tengok dalam kisah Nabi Ibrahim apabila Nabi Ibrahim berdepan dengan Namrus dalam peristiwa uh, penghancuran berhala itu bila Namrus uh, dan pengikut-pengikut dia tidak dapat berujuh dengan Nabi Ibrahim kenapa mereka menyembah berhala akhirnya jawapannya ialah harriquhu wansuru alihatakum bakarlah Ibrahim itu dan belalah Tuhan-Tuhan kamu jadi akhirnya menggunakan kekuasaan eh, kuasa politik dan juga undang-undang untuk menghancurkan gerakan. Nabi kita Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam sendiri waktu berada di Mekah. Apabila orang Quraisy tidak dapat menghadapi perkembangan Islam, mereka tidak dapat berujuh dengan Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, mereka maka mereka apa ni? Uh, merancang dan berusaha untuk menghalai Nabi dengan berbagai cara. Wa izyam kurubikal ladina kafaru liyaqtuluka au lisabbituka liukhrijuka au liyaqtuluka au liukhrijuk eh sama ada nak kurung nak penjara halau daripada negeri Mekah ataupun perekat yang paling keras ialah membunuh nabi sehingga akhirnya nabi uh, terpaksa berhijrah ke Madinah jadi ini sikap-sikap yang biasa dalam sejarah dakwah dan dalam sejarah perjuangan dan doktor Zakir Naik ini tu habui kelebihan kepada dia ialah dia mempunyai ingatan yang kuat maklumat yang luas dan kemudian hujah yang kemah dia mari Kelantan baru mari sekali tapi maklumat tentang Kelantan ni ada sebahagiannya dia lebih tahu pada kita bukan kita tak baca kita tak ingat dia boleh ingat berapa jumlah rakyat Kelantan berapa ramai orang Islam berapa persen eh dan dia boleh cerita kemarin dalam waktu kita mengadap duli yang maha mulia tu aku bila sambil tunggu tu aku kita buat dia mengeluarkan fakta-fakta tentang Kelantan berdasarkan 
uh, statistik yang dikeluar oleh uh, agensi kerajaan sendiri. Dan saya rasa tidak ramai dekat kita yang ada maklumat itu uh, di kalangan kita sendiri. Jadi ini antara kelebihan yang Tuhan bagi. Lagi uh, dalam dakwah ini, setiap orang ni setiap penceramah dan pendakwah dia ada uh, pendekatan dia sendiri, style. Jadi mungkin ada orang yang mungkin tidak uh, rasa tidak sesuai dengan style dia. Tapi style ini kebolehan masing-masing. Kebolehan masing-masing. Dan dalam konteks dakwah, kita memerlukan kepelbagaian gaya dan pendekatan sebab kita berdepan dengan segmen-segmen masyarakat yang berbeza. Kalau kita tengok dalam Quran sendiri, Allah Subhanahu SWT dalam menyampaikan kebenaran agama menggunakan pendekatan yang berbagai-bagai. Ada ayat Quran, Tuhai gaya. Ada ayat Quran, Tuhai ajak dengan molek. Ada yang Tuhai berujuh dengan baik tapi ada perekat tu eh mengherdik mengherdik dan kemudian mencabar orang-orang yang tidak menerima kebenaran Islam ini maka sebab tu dalam dakwah ni bila kita sebut dakwah kita tidak guna perkataan yang lembut saja sebab satu salah faham pada pandangan saya saya ambil sikit masa sebab katanya tayangan ni live jadi ni peluang nak tengok dunia nak tengok dia tak faham tak apa <laughs> eh jadi Antara kelemahan kesilapan kita bila kita sebut dakwah-dakwah ni kita kata lemah lembut. Lemah lembut saja kita kena lemah lembut, kita kena beraluh. Sebenarnya dakwah ini dia kena pelbagai. Supaya kita didik anak. Ada anak yang kita boleh gaya, ada anak yang kita boleh nasihat, ada anak yang kita boleh bicar, tapi ada anak bahasa kena kena jetik ling. Ha, setengah tu siapa kena napa Jepun baru dia reti. Tu tu cara kita. Jadi kalau keluarga kita sendiri pun ada sifat yang berbeza, maka madu'u ataupun sasaran dakwah juga tentulah berbagai. Maka sebab itu kita seorang Islam, masyarakat Islam kena ada pendakwah-pendakwah yang berbagai. Pendakwah yang berbagai. Dan kita tidak boleh satu keedoh saja, satu bentuk, satu style saja. Kita mesti pelbagaikan benda ni. Sebab itu Tuhan kata udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Sini banyak orang salah faham. Hikmah ni biasa kata lemah lembut. Sebenarnya bil hikmah tu dalam tafsir eh ada beberapa tafsir eh tapi tafsir eh yang pada pandangan saya yang terbaik yang lebih tepat ialah bil Quran. Udu ila sabil rabbika bil hikmati maksudnya bil Quran iaitu menggunakan metodologi, uslub dan approach yang digunakan oleh Allah Subhanahu wa taala dalam Quran tu macam-macam. Dalam macam-macam. Ada yang mungkin pada pandangan orang lain ni pada kata itu ekstrim. Sebagai contoh Nabi Ibrahim. Bila dia berujuh habis dan dengar kau dia tak boleh. Nabi Ibrahim ini pergi pecah berhala. Memecahkan berhala yang disembah oleh kaum dia. Itu satu pendekatan dalam konteks hari ini. Dalam orang yang cakap rahmatalil alamin. Tentulah ekstrim. Tentulah ekstrim. Tetapi itulah keedah yang paling baik. Pada waktu itu untuk menyedarkan masyarakat. Dia terdakwah dengan cara biasa, ceramah ke apa semua, orang tak dengar, akhir pecah berhala. Bila pecah berhala, berdepan dengan enam berus diri. Dan pada waktu itulah, dia boleh menerangkan tetap Islam dan kebatilan amalan kaum dia pada waktu itu dengan terbuka dan didahadapai orang ramah, termasuklah raja enam berus pada waktu itu. Jadi saya sekali sebut ni sebab saya banyak, bila kita bercakap, kita hadir dalam program-program, orang Duk sebut Islam ni lemah lembut. Islam ni lemah lembut. Kalau Islam ni lemah lembut saja, tidak akan berlaku peperangan dalam sejarah Nabi. Tidak akan berlaku ghazwah, tidak akan berlaku syariah. Dalam sejarah Nabi ini, Nabi perang sendiri tak kurang pada 17 kali. Berdarah. Dia sendiri akak pedang, dia sendiri ke, ke tengah medan. Nak menunjukkan kepada kita ialah bagaimana luas je. Eh, kaedah dan juga pendekatan kita dalam menyampaikan agama ini. Ada masa kita boleh berlembah lembut, ada masa kita mesti menunjukkan sikap. Lebih lagi pada zaman moden pada hari ini, mana orang mencabar Islam secara terbuka. Orang menghina agama kita, orang menghina Nabi kita dengan secara terbuka. Tak okey dalam keadaan macam ni kita nak masih nak masih berlembut lagi. Kita tidak berani menyatakan sikap. Sedekah penghinaan eh, kepada Nabi ni, kalau kita baca dalam kitab, eh, hukum mati selalu, tak ada hukum meja, Tak ada hukumnya denda, mati selalu. Siapa-siapa yang menghina Nabi. Jadi ini sebagai contoh saya nak sebut supaya kita boleh faham keadaan ini. Dan kita harap dengan uh, seramuh yang akan disampaikan oleh Dr. Zakir Naik akan membuka 
uh, minda kita menambahkan maklumat dan juga hujah-hujah kita dalam memahami agama dan insya-Allah kita boleh menyampaikan. Karena tanggungjawab menyampaikan agama ni tanggungjawab semua orang, okay? bukan ustaz saja, bukan zakir naik saja. Tapi semua orang okay, kita bertanggungjawab menyampaikan kebenaran Islam dalam kapasiti kita masing-masing. Kerana Nabi sebut dalam haji yang terakhir itu selepas dia baca dalam haji, apa ni khutbah al-wada' itu Nabi kata fal yuballighu ash-shahidu minkumul ghaib. Eh, fal yuballighu ash-shahid minkumul ghaib. Hak mari hari ini kena sapa kepada orang okay? hak tak tak mari. Maknanya menyampaikan Islam, menyebarkan Islam ni tanggungjawab setiap orang okay? daripada kita sekadar kemampuan yang ada pada kita. Orang aling buat cara orang aling, orang kurang aling buat cara orang kurang aling. Jadi insya-Allah Semoga Allah SWT merahmati usaha kita yang sedikit, memberikan uh, rahmat kepada kita dan menjadikan ini sebagai sebahagia daripada amal soleh uh, kita yang akan dapat kita jadikan bekalan menuju ke akhirat nanti. Jadi akhir sekali, saya sekali lagi mengucapkan terima kasih uh, especially to our honorable guest, uh, Dr. Zakir Nai and his team which was, I was told that was flown in from uh, outside Malaysia to to enable this occasion uh, to make it uh, a successful one insyaallah aku lu qauli hadza wa astaghfirullah alazim li wa lakum wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you very much to you yang berhormat Dr. Haji Muhammad Amar Abdullah Deputy Chief Minister of Kelantan for the welcoming speech thank you Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to welcome the world most renowned Islamic scholars for the executive talks with all the Kelantan civil servants. And before that, I'd like to give a few biography about Dr. Zaki Knight. He was born in Mumbai, India, and professionally turning around from being a medical doctor to the dynamic international orator on Islam and, and a comparative religion. And he got his Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery from the University of Mumbai. And he's the president of the Islamic Research Foundation in Mumbai, India, and also the founder of the Peace TV, which is the largest watched Islamic TV channels, as well as any religious satellite TV in the entire world, with over 100 million viewerships on which 25% are non-Muslims. Dr. Zakir Knight clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clear misconceptions about Islam using the Holy Al-Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with the reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to the challenging question posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last 20 years, Dr. Zakir Knight had delivered more than 2,000 public talks in many countries all over the world. Among the billion-plus population in India, Dr. Zakir Knight was ranked number 82 in the 100 most powerful Indians and ranked number 3 in the top spiritual gurus of India. Apart from that, at the global level, he was ranked in the top 70 least of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world. Dr. Zakir Knight has been regularly on international TV channels in 200 countries worldwide, regularly invited for TVs and radio interviews, and he has also authored many books on Islam as well as on the comparative religion. Dr. Zakir also received many awards and recognition at the international level. Sheikh Ahmad Didat, world's famous orator on Islam, had called Dr. Zaid, this is Didat Plus. He also received the King Faisal International Prize in 2015, which is similar to the Nobel Prize from the King Salman Abdul Aziz Al Saud, the custodian of the two holy mosques. In Dubai, he received the Dubai International Holy Quran, the award Islamic Personality, and also in Malaysia. In 2013, he received 
pendelik yang, di, yang di Pertuan Agong, The Tokoh Maal Hijrah for the Distinguished International Personality Award 2013. Respected brothers and sisters, I am truly honoured to welcome our beloved brother, Dr. Zakir Naib, to deliver his executive talk on the topic of misconceptions about Islam. Kota Darul Naim, with due respect, I present to you, Dr. Zakir Naib, Takbir! 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 Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalam Ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmain Amma abad A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Udu ila sabili rabbika balikma Wal ma'azat al hasna Wajadu billati ahsan Rabbi shali sadri Wa yisilli amri Wahlu al uqdat min lisani yafqaw kawli My special elders And my brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be invited by the Chief Minister of Klantan for a lecture tour of Klantan 2019. It was a desire for me to come to Klantan, and alhamdulillah, Allah has fulfilled it. And I'm very happy to be in this state. And as the Chief Minister told me yesterday, that I should make this my second home. The topic of this morning's talk is misconceptions about Islam. It is the duty of every Muslim that he or she should convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. It's a farth for every Muslim that he should dawa. It's his duty that he removes the misconceptions from the minds of the non-Muslim. And I started my talk by quoting a verse of the glorious Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, where Allah says, Udu ila wa hasna, Invite all to the way of their Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. When the Muslims do da'wah, there are various different strategies and techniques of doing da'wah. Some are less effective, while the others are more effective. The most common methodology used by the common Muslims is that whenever they want to do da'wah to a non-Muslim, and when they meet a non-Muslim, they speak hundred good things about Islam. After you speak hundred good things about Islam, even if the non-Muslim agrees with it, at the back of his mind, he will think, ah, you are the same Muslim who is a terrorist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who is a fundamentalist, who is an extremist. Ah, you are the people who marry more than one woman. Ah, you are the people who subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the veil. These few negative points at the back of his mind will prevent the non-Muslim from accepting the beauty of Islam. So whenever I meet a non-Muslim, the first question I ask him up front is what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable. You can criticize Islam, you can attack the Quran, I can take it. And when I make him comfortable and ask him, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? He poses about three or four questions. And these three or four questions invariably fall amongst the 20 most common questions asked by the non-Muslims. 
If every Muslim knows the reply to these 20 most common questions asked by the non-Muslims, even if we cannot convert him, at least he can neutralize him. He can remove the animosity which is there in the minds of the non-Muslim. How do these questions come in the mind of the non-Muslim? Today we find that the international media, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. We find in the international media, whether it be the international newspaper, the international magazines, the radio broadcast station, the international satellite channels, whether it be the social media, whether it be the Facebook, whether it be the Twitter, we find there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. They are bombarding misinformation about Islam. And why they are doing this, we will deal tomorrow in my topic, Islamophobia. And depending upon how the media portrays Islam, these 20 common questions keep on changing. The 20 common questions that we have today, 20 years back they were different. Maybe 10 years back it will change. And if you hear my talk 10 years back on the same topic, the order has changed. Depending upon how the media portrays Islam, these 20 common questions keep on changing. And if every Muslim knows the reply to these 20 common questions based on reason, logic, science, on Quran, Hadith, religious scriptures of the other religions, it is more important and better for a Muslim to know the answers of the 20 most common questions than to know the answer of 200 uncommon questions. And these common questions are the same. I have traveled in different parts of the world, whether you go to USA, whether you go to Canada, UK, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Pakistan. These 20 common questions are the same. There may be an additional one or two questions depending upon that society. Otherwise, the 20 common questions are the same. And I've written a book on this. Time will not permit us to deal with the replies to all the 20 common questions. We'll try and cover as many as we can. But there's a book available of mine on the same topic, which says that reply to the most common question asked by non-Muslims. It's also available on the net. It's translated into various different languages. And I think it's also translated in Malay many years back. Inshallah, in the limited time we have, we will discuss the first few misconceptions. Today, the most common misconception regarding Islam, the most misunderstood word regarding Islam today is the word jihad. It is not only misunderstood by the, Mus the non-Muslims, it's also misunderstood by the Muslims. Unfortunately, most of the non-Muslims, as well as the Muslims, they think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for fame, whether it be for land, for any reason, if any Muslim does a war, it's called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for money, whether it be for fame, whether it be for land. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In the Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad means to strive and struggle against oppression. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in self-defense in the war. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. If a student is striving and struggling to pass in his examination, in Arabic we say he's doing jihad. And many people have a misconception, including amongst the Muslims, that jihad can only be done by the Muslims. Quran in no less than two places say, it says that even non-Muslims do jihad. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 
14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents, to be kind to the parents. In travel upon travel did the mother bore you, and in years twain was a weaning. And after that, the next verse, of Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 15 says, but if your parents do jihad, they strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of which you have no knowledge, then do not obey them. But live with them with love and companionship. The same message is repeated in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 8. We have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. But if their parents do jihad, they struggle and strive to make them worship somebody else besides Allah, they do not obey them. Allah is very clear cut that you have to love and respect and obey your parents. But if they go against Allah and His Rasul, that's the only time you should not obey them. So here, the Quran is talking about non-Muslim parents, mushriks, who are forcing the children doing jihad to make them do shirk. This is called as jihad fi sabi shaitan. Striving in the way of this Satan, shaitan. Normally, when we use the word jihad, what we Muslims should do is jihad fi sabilillah. Strive and struggle in the way of Allah. So whenever the word jihad is used, it is understood by default, it is jihad fi sabilillah. Unless it specified something else. Generally, by default, the word jihad means jihad fi sabilillah, striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every Muslim should do jihad fi sabilillah. The mushriks, what they do, and the kuffar, they do jihad fi sabi shaitan. Many of the orientalists, they translate the word jihad as holy war. If you translate holy war into Arabic, it is harbu muqaddasa. This word holy war or harbu muqaddasa appears nowhere in the Quran. It appears nowhere in the Hadith. It's not there. This word holy war was first used to describe the crusaders, the Christian missionaries several centuries ago, when they killed in the name of Christianity and they forced tens of thousands of people they killed <coughs> and they forced them to accept Islam that time this word holy war was given and today these people are using this negative term on us they do all the killing for centuries if you read history there is no religion like Christianity who has killed tens of thousands of people in the name of religion and now they're blaming Islam. So holy war is a mistranslation. It does not mean jihad. Jihad means to strive and struggle. One type of striving and struggling is called eskital. That is going for war, one type of jihad. And the rules and regulation laid down in Islamic in Islamic war, there are rules and regulations. You cannot chop down trees, you cannot destroy monastery, should not hurt the women, should not hurt the elderly people. All these rules are there. Imagine you cannot even hurt the trees. Leave us as human beings. And Quran is very clear cut. When the media blames and says Islam is involved in killing, there is no worse in any other scripture which is close to the verse in the Quran. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder, or for spreading mischief in the land, or spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Allah says in the Quran, if anyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, any innocent human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And Allah continues, 
if anyone saves one human being, it is as though he has saved the whole nation. This one single verse of the Quran is sufficient to disprove the myth that is spread by the media. For more details on this topic, you can refer to my lecture on jihad and terrorism and Islamic perspective. We'll discuss this number one jihad. It came number one in the list after 9-11, after September 11. It wasn't there in the list at all. In my old list, the word jihad wasn't there. But after 9-11, because of Islamophobia, we'll discuss tomorrow, the word jihad not only entered the list, came top of the charts. The second question that is asked by the non-Muslims, and they say that Muslims, they are fundamentalist. They're extremist. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if a person wants to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. For a person to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. You can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush that all are good. As a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. For example, if you have a fundamentalist robber, a thief, whose profession is to rob, he is not good for the society. On the other hand, if you have a fundamentalist doctor whose fundamental is to save human life and who has saved thousands of lives, then that fundamentalist is a good fundamentalist. So you can't paint all fundamentals with the same brush that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I am concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to call myself a fundamentalist Muslim because I know, I follow and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam and I know that there is not a single teaching in Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be certain queries in the mind of the non-Muslim because they may not be aware of the teachings of Islam or they may not know the reason and the logic why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down that rule. So based on this misconception, they may think it is against humanity. But according to me, there is not a single teaching of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. When we read the Webster's Dictionary, we come to know that the word fundamentalism was first used in the early part of the 20th century, when the Protestant Christians, they protested against the church. The church believed that time that the message, the Bible, the message in the Bible was from the word of God. These Protestant Christians, they protested and they said, not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every word, every letter of the Bible is from God, then this movement is a good movement. But if someone can prove that every word is not the word from God, then this movement is a bad movement. So this word fundamentalism and the word fundamentalist was first used for the Protestant Christians. That's how it was coined. But when we read the Oxford Dictionary, Oxford Dictionary says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient scriptures of any religion. But when we read the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, there's a change, slight addition. 
It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient scriptures of a religion, especially Islam. So now the word Islam has been added to the revised definition in the Oxford Dictionary. Imagine this word fundamentalist was first used for the Christians. And today, it is used for the Muslims. And we Muslims, most of the time, we go in defense. No, 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 I'm not a fundamentalist. And we go on the defense. I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm not an extremist. I say, I am an extremist. I'm extremely kind. I'm extremely loving. I'm extremely honest. I'm extremely just. What is wrong in being extremely kind, extremely merciful, extremely honest, extremely just? Quran says you should be extremely kind, extremely just, extremely honest. You can't be partly just. When it benefits you, you want to be just. When it doesn't benefit you, you don't want to be just. This is not correct. So Islam believes in being extremely kind, extremely just, extremely merciful, extremely loving, extremely honest. But be an extremist in the correct direction. Don't be an extremist in the wrong direction. If I have to be a good Muslim, I have to be a fundamentalist Muslim. I have to be an extremist Muslim. What the Quran says, La taglu fi deenukum. Do not commit excesses. Being excessive and being a fanatic is wrong. But being an extremist, if I have to be a good doctor, I have to be extremist in the field of medicine. I cannot say I will follow medicine 50%, 70%, 80%. So if I have to be a good practicing Muslim, I have to be an extremist Muslim. So let us turn the tables over. You know, we Muslims are so defensive, apologetic. We are ashamed to call ourselves Muslim. Why? Turn the tables over. Coming to the third most common allegation, misconception that the non-Muslims have regarding Islam is that Muslims are terrorists. What is the meaning of the word terrorist? A terrorist, by definition, means a person who causes terror. And I used to give a definition in detail for which there was objection by the previous Home Secretary of UK, Theresa May, because of this Islamophobia. And when she came to power, she wanted to ban the most popular Muslim preacher, she did not know me. But the moment they came to power, in less than one month, she excluded me from London. Exclusion means I'm not allowed to enter UK. Other thing, I'm not banned. Many people have a misconception that in UK, ban means my books are not allowed, my lectures cannot be aired on the television, I cannot be part of any company, I cannot be part of any trust. I wasn't banned, I was excluded. Exclusion means I wasn't allowed to enter. I had a valid visa. I suppose to give talks in various big venues. Wembley Arena and various parts because you know previously the Labour Party was in power and in 2009 the head of the counter-terrorism department that was Charles Farr he sent an officer and he told me the Dr. Nayak you are very popular among the Muslims can you help us I said how can I help you can you help us to reach those Muslims who we cannot reach? So I told him, yes, I'm aware there's misconceptions about Islam in UK amongst the non-Muslims, in the government, in some of the Muslims in UK. I will help you under two conditions. Number one, you should not ask me to do anything which is against Quran and Sunnah. And number two, I don't want your money. They agreed. But within a few months, the government changed. Labour Party lost and Conservative came to power and Theresa May became the Home Secretary in 2010. Moment she comes to power, she wants to ban me. 
the head of the counterterrorism department tells, how can you ban Dr. Zakir Naik? You know, he's a very good speaker, he explains. I have attended several lectures on counterterrorism to various parts of the world. Even just last month, two weeks back, I addressed an Interpol in a European country. It's common, I go up on giving advice, and now she wants to ban me. So they could not get a speech of mine, they get a fabricated speech, that to cut the story short. In the letter of exclusion, one of the main points is my definition of terrorist. And I'll say what I said, and why I'll say I will tell you. I said that as far as a terrorist is concerned, a terrorist is a person who causes terror. When a police, when a robber sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the robber, the policeman is a terrorist. In this context, every Muslim should be a terrorist to the anti-social element. Whenever a criminal sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever a rapist sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever a decoit sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Any anti-social element, whenever they look at a Muslim, they should be terrified. Every Muslim should be a terrorist to the anti-social element. And I went on to further say, I'm aware that terrorist commonly means to terrorize a common human being. In this context, no Muslim should ever terrorize any innocent person, any common human being. He should selectively terrorize the anti-social element. As far as the others are concerned, it is the duty of the Muslim to spread peace. Based on this, they picked up my verse out of all. Oh, Dr. Zakir Naik says every Muslim is a terrorist. Every Muslim should be a terrorist. And they excluded me. And in the letter, she gave the full context. Full context. And my lawyer said, 99.9% .9 will win. So we did a case. I was one of the first Muslims who did a case against the government, a Muslim speaker, right up to the Supreme Court, the International Court. We won the first round. But you know, in politics, the government has control even over the judiciary. So when we went to the higher court, in the court of appeal, the judge said, we are not going to look into the merits why she banned. She's a home secretary, she's a home minister. She has the prerogative to ban who she wants. Oh, sorry, exclude who she wants. So they did not go, the lower court went into the merits and said it is wrong. But the higher court overruled by saying that we don't want to go into the merits. She has the right to disallow entry who she wants. Then we went to the Supreme Court, we went to the, uh, to the International Court of Hague. And we knew we would not win because everything is not just everywhere. But we, we were able to fulfill our aim. Our aim was that to continue our channel. You know, so we lose the battle, but they win the war. That particular case we lost, but they could not come further. And yet, alhamdulillah, since 2007 till now, for 12 years we are continuing. Every day there's a struggle. Every day. Islamophobia. Yesterday, one week before, it's there and we are fighting. Till the last breath, we will do it. Why? And this, after this, after the ban, I avoided giving this anywhere. And now again, in 2010, after that, till now, I said, if it's causing a problem, okay, I will avoid saying every Muslim is a terrorist. Should be. And I avoid it. On the request. Why am I saying now again? After, after about seven, eight years, I'm saying again. Why? Because just less than one week ago, on the 3rd of August, 2019, the new Home Secretary, her name is Preeti, Preeti Patel, origin, I think is Indian, same like my origin. She became the new Home Secretary, and what does she do? She copies my statement. And she might have said maybe on the 2nd of August, but if you read the newspaper Daily Mail, on the 3rd of August 2019, headlines, Preeti, colon, 
I want to terrify the criminals. I want the criminals to be terrified. What they excluded the previous Home Secretary that excluded me for this statement, the new Home Secretary, she copies me. So I want to know that when the new Home Secretary, recently appointed, hardly one week back, maybe last, last Friday, she, she made this statement, and on 3rd of August 2013, five days back, it comes in the newspaper as headline, Priti Patel, the newly appointed Home Secretary, I want to, I want the criminals to be terrified. And then the press says, this is zero tolerance, zero tolerance. When Home Secretary, non-Muslim of UK says this, it is zero tolerance. When Zakir Naik, a Muslim die, says, they say he's promoting terrorism. Double standards. Same statement. So I want to know that will the UK government today, will they apologize to me? Will they reverse the exclusion? Will they? What do you think? Will they? Will they? Yes or no? Yes or no? Of course not. Because they don't believe in justice. If they believed in justice, the new Home Secretary should write an apology letter to me that my predecessor, and she's not in favor of Theresa May, my predecessor, that Theresa May, she wrongly has excluded you, I reverse it and I apologize. They will not. And what Allah did, Theresa May later on became the Prime Minister of UK. And what? She was humiliated. A few months back, she was humiliated in her own parliament. She was forced to step down. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 54. Allah planned and plotted. Allah two plans. They planned and plotted. Allah two plans. Allah is the best of planner. They plan against Adai. Allah plans against them. Coming back to the answer on terrorism, many a times two different labels are given to the same individual for the same activity. And a very good example is when the Britishers, when they were ruling India, maybe 70, 80 years back, there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. These Indians, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. We common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters. Same person, same activity, two different labels. If you agree with the view of the UK government that they had the right to rule over India, you would call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that UK came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, you call these people as freedom fighters. Same person, same activity, two different labels. So before you give the label, you have to try and understand which view do you agree to. And when the Indian press, they have interviewed me many times, ask them a simple question. That the British government, they had called Bhagat Singh, a very famous freedom fighter, they call Bhagat Singh as a terrorist. Do you agree? They said, no. I said, why? Because we know the Indian history. You are not a terrorist. You are the freedom fighter. I said, even I agree with you. Even I don't call him a terrorist. I call him a freedom fighter. I call him a patriot. But I am asking you a question today, when the UK media is saying that that Muslim is a terrorist, why do you believe? Why don't you do your research? They were laughing. <laughs> and today I want to tell them, when they call me a terrorist, why do you repeat? Bhagat Singh, you say he's not a terrorist. Why Dr. Zakir Naik is terrorist? Why? Why double standard? They cannot get a single sentence in my speech out of context which promotes violence or terrorism. But yet, the media, they want to sensationalize it. Why these double standards? And we can give you several examples. Many centuries ago, 
when the Britishers were ruling America. In 1775, there was the American Revolution. And at that time, the Britishers, they called George Washington as terrorist number one. Number one terrorist. Later on, America gets his freedom and George Washington is made the president of USA. Imagine, terrorist number one of the world become the president of USA. And all the presidents to follow, they are following the Godfather. We have the example in South Africa. The previous white apartheid government, they arrested Nelson Mandela and imprisoned him for more than 25 years in Robben Islands and called him the terrorist, the biggest terrorist, and they imprisoned him. Later on, South Africa gets its freedom. Nelson Mandela is released. He becomes the president of South Africa. Not only that, later on, he gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine, the previous terrorist, biggest terrorist in the world is later on getting the Nobel Prize for Peace. Not that he was bad and he became good. For the same activity which he was imprisoned, afterwards he gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. These are double standards. So what we understand, that whenever anyone gives a label, if the person is powerful, the label gets stuck. What does Islam say? What does Allah say? Allah says in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 6, whenever you get information, you check it up before you pass it on to the third person. <coughs> that means whenever anyone gives the information, especially if he's a Fasik, before passing on, you have to verify. Today, very common, you get a WhatsApp message, you see something, you pass it. It may be fabricated, it may be manipulated, it may be sex scandal, it may be on terrorism, it may be true, maybe not true. If you cannot verify, don't spend it. If you are going to spread it, the punishment will come on you also, as a Muslim. If someone passes me a fabricated video, and if I forward it without checking, beside the person, even you are responsible. Why did you spread it? So Allah says in the Quran, whenever you get information, you check it up, verify it before you pass it on to the next person. The fourth most common misconception regarding Islam is that Islam was spread by the sword. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. So if you translate, it means peace was spread by the sword. It's an irony. Doesn't make sense. But we know that in Islam, Islam is a peaceful religion. It is totally against violence. But like every country, it has a police force, it has its rules and regulations, it wants peace and security, but there is a police force which uses sometimes force to implement peace. But this police only uses as a last resort, if it's a good police. Huh? Some police use it for wrong things in some countries. But generally, to maintain peace, the police may have to use force to maintain peace. In the same way in Islam, violence is prohibited. Except as a last resort, if you want to maintain peace and somebody want to disrupt peace, that's the time you can use force. The best reply to this misconception is given by Delisio O'Leary. He's a very famous historian. He writes in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8 that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastically absurd myth that historians have ever repeated.
we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. The Crusaders came, they wiped out the Muslim. There was not a single Muslim who could give the Adhan openly. And today in Spain, hardly you find any Muslim, just a small percentage. We ruled Spain for 800 years. We didn't use force. We have the example of the Arab countries. For the last several decades, the Muslims have been the lord of the Arab land. A few years the Britishers came, a few years the French came, but overall, we have been the lord of the Arab land. We have ruled the Arab land for the last several decades. Today, there are about 9 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means they're Christians in generation. If the Muslims would have used the sword and forced everyone to accept Islam, there would not be a single non-Muslim alive. These 9 million Arab Coptic Christians in Arab land, in Egypt, etc., they are giving shahada that Islam was spread by the sword. The country where I come from, India, we Muslims, we ruled India for about a thousand years. And at that time, India was the most powerful country in the world. It was called as a golden bird. And the amount of development that India made when the Muslims ruled is phenomenal. We ruled India for a thousand years, we didn't use the sword. Today, more than 75% of the Indian population, they are non-Muslims. These 75% non-Muslim Indian population, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. If we wanted, if the Muslims wanted, they could have converted everyone at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. These 75% non-Muslims in India, they are giving shahada that Islam was spread by the sword. And today they say, after the new government has come, Muslims should leave the country. Who fought for the freedom? If you name the people who fought for the freedom of the country, you will find umpteen number of Muslims. When Muslims came, India became the strongest country in the world, most richest, most powerful. Britishers came, they looted it. They took away the wealth. So today, Indian government has no problem with Britishers. They're very close friends because they looted them. They took all the wealth. We made the proper, they made the Indians as slaves. Many slaves they bought in this country, Malaysia also. Why these double standards? The people that helped the country grow to come to its level, the highest that India was at any time was when the Muslims ruled. It was the richest country. The British has come and they loot them and they're very close to them. They rob them. They make them slaves. Yet they want to be, they didn't want to follow the master. These 75% non-Muslims in India, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia, which has the largest population of Muslims in the world? Which Muslim army came to Malaysia? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Where many countries Majority of the population are Muslims. Which sort? They did by their class. Traders went. Which army came to Malaysia? Which army went to Indonesia? The majority, almost all were non-Muslims, then almost all became Muslims, mashallah. And later on, now there are people coming afterwards. Malaysia became fully Muslim. Then you had the Chinese coming, you had the Indian coming, the Britishers coming. They are our new guest. You know, somebody called me a guest. So I said, before me, the Chinese are the guest. They aren't born here. So if you want the new guest to go first, ask the old guest to go back. The Chinese, they're not born here, most of them. Or maybe the new generation, yes. So if you want the guest to go back, and those guests which are bringing peace in the community, they are benefit for the family. Which sword? Thomas Carlyle in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, he writes, Which sword? Every new idea originates in the mind of one. 
in one man's head alone it dwells. One man in the full world. Little good it will do that he propagates his idea with a sword. Which sword? Even if the Muslim had the sword, he can't use it. Because Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 256, La deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. What Thomas Carlyle is talking about the sword is the sword of intellect, the sword of love, the sword of reasoning, the sword of mercy. As I started my talk, Allah says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125, Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. It is the sword of love. It is the sword of reasoning. It is the sword of mercy, which is conquering the hearts. No wonder today, the fastest growing religion in the world today is Islam. According to an article which came in Eater Digest Almanac Yearbook in 1984, it gave the statistics of the increase in the major world religion for a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984. And number one religion that increased the maximum was Islam, 235%. In a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984, in a span of 50 years, Islam increased by 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I'm asking the question, which war took place between 1934 and 1984, which forced the non-Muslim to become Muslims? Which war? Today, the fastest going religion in America is Islam. The fastest going religion in Europe is Islam. The fastest going religion in the world is Islam. And however much they're trying to attack Islam, Alhamdulillah, that much Islam is spreading. I would like to end the answer of this question and this allegation, this misconception, with the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson says that people worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of peace, into brackets, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Though Adam Pearson is a critic, he wrote the statement against Islam, trying to tell them that you don't wait for the nuclear bomb. The Islamic bomb has already been dropped. I call Islamic bomb is the bomb of peace. I agree with him. It has been dropped. It is not the bomb to kill like the Hiroshima, like what the Westerners did. It is the Islamic bomb of peace. It already fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. The fifth most common question asked by the non Muslim is that why does Islam allow? a man to have more than one wife. Talking about polygamy. Polygamy means a person having more than one spouse. A man having more than one wife or a woman having more than one husband. Polygamy is of two types. One is polygyny, where a man has more than one wife and the other is polyandry, where a woman has more than one husband. So Islam does not allow polyandry. We'll discuss that in the next answer. But allows limited polygyny. A man to have more than one wife. As far as polygyny is concerned, Quran is the only religious book in the world which has the statement, marry only one. If you read any other book, any other religious book, whether it be the Hindu scriptures, whether Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, Veda, Bible, no book in the world, religious scripture, except the Quran, says marry only one. I'll come to it later on. Today, if you read the scripture of the various world religions, there's no restriction at all. If you read the Hindu scriptures, Mahabharata, Veda, Upanishad. Nowhere does it say that one man should only marry one woman. 
In fact, if you read the scripture, if you read Ramayan, the father of Ram, who they consider God, King Dashrath, he had more than one wife. Lord Krishna in Mahabharat, how many wives he had? 16,108 wives. So there's no restriction in the Hindu scripture. If you read the Christian scripture, nowhere does the Bible say marry only one. It is the church recently which has put a ban that Christians should not marry more than one wife. The church, not the Bible. In the Jewish community, they used to marry multiple wives until Rabbi Genshem ben Yehuda from 960 to 100 and 1030, he put an edict and said that Jews should marry only one. Till as late as 1950s, the Jews that lived in Muslim community, Sephardic Jews, they used to marry more than one wife. It is only after the chief rabbi of Israel in 1950 has put a ban on Jews that they cannot marry more than one wife. But according to the scriptures, they can marry, there's no restriction. If you read the status of women in Islam printed in the Indian government in 1975, it gives the statistics of polygamous marriages done in India between 1951 to 1961, for 10 years. And it says that the polygamous marriages done by the Hindus and Muslims. Muslims did polygamous marriages 4.31% in India in a span of 10 years. Hindus, 5.06. That means three-fourths percentage Hindus did more polygamous marriages as compared to Muslims in India. And by law in India, a Muslim can have more than one wife, a Hindu cannot. By law. Hindu scripture says you can marry as many as you want. There was a special Hindu marriage act in 1954, which says a Hindu should marry only one. No, this is in the constitution. You know, they, they changed it. And the, a new act they had. So now, it is illegal for a Hindu to have more than one wife. Yet, even though it is illegal, the Hindus have more polygamous marriages than Muslims in India. If it was not illegal, how many they would add? God knows. Statistics of the Indian government. Now, when I, when I present the fact, many people don't like the fact. So this is how it is come to divide. I am not come to divide, I am giving you statistics of your country. Now coming to the question, why? What does Islam say about it? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 3, marry women of your choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. This statement, marry only one, is only given in the Quran. But if you marry, there is a clause, if you can do justice. There is a clause. There is a caveat. Many people think that marrying more than one wife is further than Islam. No, it's not further. It is muba, optional. But if you do it, you should be just between the wives. There is a criteria. Now, what are the reasons for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow men to have more than one wife? By nature, Men and women are supposed to born in equal proportion, but they are not, for various reasons we'll discuss later on. They aren't born in equal proportion. But today science tells us that a female child can fight the germs and diseases much better than the male child. So medically, a female sex is more stronger than a male sex. I know many of you will be shocked. We think we are strong. Medical science, that's the reason you find more deaths amongst the male children as compared to female children. Because female is medically a stronger sex in fighting diseases as compared to male. So there are more, so in, in the pediatric age itself, there are more female as compared to male. Life goes on. Many people die because of war, because of accident, because of drug addiction, because of alcoholism, because of disease. In all these cases, there are more male dying as compared to female. So because of this, 
Today, the female population is more than the male population. There are certain countries like India, third world country, and China, where the female population is less than the male population. Why? Because of female infanticide and female feticide. According to a report, according to a UN report that was telecast on Al Jazeera on the 6th of July 2015, it said that every day in India, 7,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they're females or after the female is born, they're put to death. 7,000 every day. If you multiply this by 365, the number of days, two and a half million females every year are either aborted in India or they're killed after they're born. According to Tamil Nadu government hospital report, out of females born alive, four out of 10 are put to death, 40% are put to death. If you stop this evil practice of female feticide and female infanticide, within a few years or few decades, even in India, the female population will outnumber the male population. Anytime you watch, if you check in statistics, the lifespan of a woman is much more than a man. By a few years. Therefore, you will find more widows than widowers. You will find more women without husband who have died earlier than men whose wives have died. You will find more widows than widowers because the lifespan of a female is more. So by nature, the population of women should be more than the men. Except in countries like India and China. <coughs> because of this, the whole ratio is skewed. If they stop this evil practice, India, China, throughout the world you'll find that the females are more than males. Otherwise, in other parts of the world, according to the statistics of the CIA, World Fact Book, in New York alone, there are half million, women, half million females more than males. In USA alone, there are 4.8 million females more than males, according to CIA, World Factbook. In Germany alone, there are 1.2 million females more than males. In Bangladesh alone, 4.2 million females more than males. In Russia alone, 10 million females more than males. In European countries, in European Union, which has 28 countries all put together, 10.2 million females more than males. Imagine if my sister happened to live in USA, or your sister happens to live in USA, or in European Union, and if every man marries a woman, Yet, there will be 4.8 million females in USA alone. 10.2 million females in European Union alone, who will not find husbands. So the only option for them is that they either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. Public property is such a harsh word. I am sorry. It is the most sophisticated word I can use. There is no better word I can use. My dictionary, my language, I'm at loss of words. The most sophisticated word I can use is public property. There's no third option. Either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. And if you ask any modest woman, she would opt for the second. You know, people may ask me, the brother Zakir, which woman would like to share the husband? And I agree with them. No woman generally would like to share the husband. But a true Muslimah who knows the problem of the world, of the excess women, the Sharia says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. I know sharing the husband is not difficult, but a true Muslimah would say, I would let a small loss take place, I would share the husband and prevent my other sister in Islam from becoming a public property. This is Islam. If a true Muslimah knows the reasons why it's allowed, 
therefore it depends upon the culture. In some cultures, marrying more than one wife is okay in the Gulf country, in the Arab countries, in some it is not. This is not the only reason, but we know that the female population is more. Now it may be approximate equal because of countries like India, Pakistan, too much of killing. If they stop this killing, the percentage will increase of the women. There are various other factors where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine wisdom has allowed some men to have more than one wife. For example, if you marry a woman and you cannot have children because of some problem and you want children, you want your lineage to continue, so you have two options. You either divorce her and marry a new wife. Now what is the fault of that woman? Why should she be divorced? If there is a pro medical problem in her, why should she be divorced? The second option is keep her, give her her rights, and you marry a second woman. Take care of both. Give justice to both. In America, it, polygamy doesn't go down the throat. On a general in America, an average American, according to statistics, has eight different sexual partners before he settles down with one. Some may have two, some may have ten, some may have twenty. After marrying, how many they have is not mentioned in the statistics. But before marrying, they have eight different sexual partners before they settle down with one. So having mistresses is common, five, ten, twenty, no problem. Having a legal wife, they cannot digest it. When you have mistress, she does not have a right. She doesn't get honored. <coughs> she's looked down upon. She's degraded. When you take a second wife, she has all the respect. She has all the honor. So, but natural in Islam to protect and to take care of the woman, Allah has permitted some men to have more than one wife. Not farad, permitted. Muba. There are various other reasons. There can be a possibility that your wife may have an accident and she gets handicapped and she cannot do the duty of your wife. So what do you do? Do divorce her? In other religions, what do you do? Divorce and marry one more. And what's her fault? So in Islam, in such cases, keep her. You can take a second wife. There can be a condition where she may have a disease or she may have some problem where she may not be able to satisfy the husband. So in this case, what do you do? Keep her and marry one more. So there are various reasons you can enumerate why it's allowed. Allah has given permission, but the criteria is you have to be just between your wives. If you fulfill this criteria, then it is for the betterment of the woman as a whole. If Allah wouldn't have given this permission, then you would be having more public property than what you have today. Coming to the next most common question asked about Islam, the question number six is, if Islam allows polygyny, why does it not allow polyandry? If a man can have more than one wife, so why can't women have more than one husband? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4, number 24, they do not marry the woman which is already married. That means a woman in Islam cannot have two husbands, cannot have more than one husband. Do not marry a woman who is already married. What are the reasons? There are various reasons. Number one, the problem that is there will be multiplied. Now you have problem of many unmarried women if women start getting multiple husbands, that will get multiplied more. Furthermore, if a man has more than one wife, and if a child is born, you can identify who is the mother as well as who is the father. But if a woman has more than one husband, and if a child is born, you can identify the mother, you can't identify the father. When you go to admit your child in the school, what is the name of the father? You may have to give two names. I am aware today science has advanced. There is genetic coding, DNA coding, you can come to know the parents. But that is recent. Islam is there 
It's been hundreds of years. And this is not the only reason. The other reason is, today science tells us that a man is more polygamous in nature as compared to the woman. Furthermore, today, a man can do the duty of multiple husbands as compared to a woman who cannot do the duty of multiple wives. For example, today science tells us there are various psychological changes, there are hormonal changes, especially when she's undergoing the menstrual cycle. That's the reason Islam prohibits that you have to take care of your wife during a menstrual cycle, you cannot give divorce to her, and there are various other reasons. So because of this change in the hormonal balance, the physiological balance, the psychological balance, it will be difficult for a woman to take care of one husband, only husband should be, you know, Islam says you have to be kind during that period. If she has more husband, then more problem. So during these cycles, it's not possible for a woman to do the role of multiple wives as compared to the man who can do role of multiple husbands. Furthermore, today science tells us that if a woman has multiple husbands and all of them are loyal to each other, but a woman who has multiple sexual partners, even if they're loyal to one another, there are high chances that there will be venereal and sexually transmitted diseases, which will emerge in the woman and will be transmitted back to the man. Which is not the case if a man has multiple sexual partners and multiple wives, and if all of them are faithful and no extramarital, this disease will not emerge. This is our creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So medically, it is okay for a man to have sexual partners as long, multiple partners, as long as they're loyal in the wedlock. But for a woman to have multiple sexual partners, it's not medically correct. So this is the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why he has permitted some men to have more than one wife, but not permitted the woman to have more than one husband. Due to shortage of time, I'll just skip the seventh most common question and jump to the eighth and ninth, which is shorter. And then we'll throw the floor open for the question answer session. That's more interesting. The seventh most common question is hijab. Answer you might have heard in my earlier talks. If someone wants to know, they can ask in the question answer session. The eighth most common question is that if Islam is against idol worship, then why do the Muslims worship the Kaaba in the Salah? The reply to this question is, no Muslim ever worshipped the Kaaba. The Kaaba is our Qibla. It's our direction. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 144, that faith in the direction of the Qibla. Qibla? That's the Kaaba. Faith in the direction of the Kaaba when you offer your Salah. For example, today if you want to offer Salah here, some will say less face the north, some will say less face south, some will say east, some will say west. So for unity, Allah has commanded all of them faith in one direction towards the Kaaba. For unity. <laughs> so Kaaba is our Qibla, no one worships it. Furthermore, the Muslims were the first people who do the world map, the cartographers. And if you know history, that is geography, it was Ali Drusi in 1154 who was the first person who drew the world map. When the Muslims drew the world map, they had the South Pole on top, the North Pole down, and Kaaba in the center. Later on, the Western cartographers came, they turned the map upside down, North Pole top, South Pole down, Alhamdulillah, yet the Kaaba is in the center. So people who live in the north, they should face towards the south. People who live in the south should face towards the north. People living in the west face towards the east. People living in the east face towards the west. All of them face towards the Qibla direction, towards Kaaba. That's for unity. And when we go for Umrah or for Hajj, and now is the Hajj season, many of our brothers will be there. We do Tawaf 
circumambulation around the Kaaba. Why? The reason we circumambulate around the Kaaba is that if logically I have to think, every circle has got one center. So when we circumambulate, we are testifying there is one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a command from Allah and we circumambulate. Logically, the, the thing that I can think is because every circle has one center, it is connoting, denoting Tawheed, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And <coughs> the statement of the second caliph of Islam, Hazrat Umar radiallahu may Allah be pleased with him, is sufficient to give reply to this question. Hazrat Umar radiallahu it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, hadith number 1597. He looked at the black stone, Hajj Aswad, and told, You black stone, you can neither harm me, you can neither benefit me. Had I not seen the Prophet touch and kiss it, I too would not have touched you and kissed you. So this statement that this black stone can neither benefit me, can neither harm me, is sufficient to prove that we Muslims don't worship the Kaaba, neither Hajj Aswad. Furthermore, at the time of the Prophet, there were Sahabas who stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan. Now, which idol worshipper will stand on the idol he or she worships? So when the Sahaba stood on the Kaaba, this itself is sufficient to testify that we Muslims, we don't worship the Kaaba. The Kaaba is only our Qibla. The ninth most common question is that if Islam is a universal religion, why aren't non-Muslims allowed in the two holy cities of Makkah and Medina? And there is a verse in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, that do not allow the unbelievers to enter the Harmain, Makkah and Medina. Why? Every country has a cantonment area. I'm an Indian, but I cannot go to the cantonment area of India because only those people who are involved in the defense of the country are allowed, maybe the military, maybe the ministers. A general Indian will not be allowed. Same thing here. Even here there will be cantonment area in Malaysia. Every Malaysian cannot enter. Only the military or the ministers or the defense people can go. <coughs> A Malaysian cannot say that, why am I not allowed? That's cantonment area. It protected. Similarly, Makkah and Medina is our cantonment area, our holy two cities. Only a human being who agrees and who has submitted his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and agreed to protect it will be allowed there. A normal human being will not be allowed. Only that human being who has submitted his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and agreed that he will follow his commandment is allowed in Makkah and Medina. The second reply, every country to enter, it requires a visa. I remember in 1984, when I had first time gone to Singapore, it mentioned there, death to drug traffickers. That means if I want to enter Singapore, I have to sign that any drug trafficker caught will be put to death. If I don't agree, I won't be allowed to enter Singapore. I have to sign in the visa form, in the immigration form, death to drug trafficker. I cannot say, no, 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 drug people should not be put to death, they don't enter Singapore. I have to agree with the law. And one of the most difficult countries to get visa today is USA. Especially for the third world country. There are so many questions. So when you want the visa, you have to follow the conditions of that country. The visa, one of the main requirement, the most important requirement for the visa of Makkah and Medina is to say with your lips, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So this you have to agree. If you don't agree, then your main criteria is not fulfilled, you will not get a visa. This was a reply to the eight of the first nine most common questions asked by non-Muslims. Normally I speak for about one, one or fifteen minutes. And I throw the floor open for the question and session because question and session is more, more interesting. It's a dialogue. So I'd like to end this talk and let the question and session begin so that we have the interactive session.
فخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله Thank you very much to Honorable Dr. Zakir Naik for the very inspiring, energetic talk. That we had, uh, there are many excellent points that we have learned today. Thank you very much. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have one announcement. Uh, at this executive talk, we have uh, the Inspiracy Mu'allaf. It is one of an NGO. That is led by Brother Muhammad Roger James Arnold. And today, the Inspiracy Mu'allaf is opening the, a small booth at the foyer of this hall. And uh, they are raising funds to assist the Mu'allaf as well as the, the Asnaf. And what you can do today, you can donate to the Inspiracy Mu'allaf either by purchasing a special t shirt or simply. Donating some money for the inspiracy Allah, inshallah. Ladies and gentlemen, before we go to the question and answer session, I'd like to give a few brief guidelines as well as rules so that uh, the session will run very smooth. And to derive more benefits for everyone, uh, the first rules we have before that, I'd like to announce we have four microphones. On the gentleman side, we have two microphones. I believe uh, the first one, this is the number one, and number two station here. And then for ladies, we have uh, at the center, number three. And then finally, station number four, on the far to the right. Okay? Okay, first one, before you put forward your questions, please state your full name. For example, my name is Muhammad bin Abdullah. And your profession, I'm Muhammad Abdullah, I'm a lawyer. Simply like that, okay? Second one, the question asked should be relevant to the topic that we are discussing today. And I believe for gentlemen, the topic polygamy is going to be a hard one. <laughs> and also for ladies. So please be aware that this is not a debate or lecture time for you. Just speak clearly, directly to the point, go to your question directly. Okay? Third one, only one question should be asked at one time. If you have another question, you have to go back in queue and wait for another chance to ask another question. And finally, it is an honor for Dr. Zakir Knight for non-Muslim. Do we have non-Muslim today in this hall? Do we have non-Muslim among the civil servants in Kelantan? Where the majorities are mostly the Muslim? Do we have one at least non-Muslim here? Yeah, we have. Alhamdulillah. You are given the first preference to ask the questions before the Muslims. So please don't be afraid. We are in a safe place. This is the most peaceful programs organized by the Kelantan government, inshallah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin the question and answer question, question and answers. And I'd like to welcome for the first question on the left side, on the gentleman's side, on the station number one. Please, gentlemen. Kota Dronaim, come on. One Question from gentleman's side. On the first station, please, mic number one. Please put forward your question. Anybody? Okay, thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Honorable Doctor, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, obviously, topic five was the most um, uh, interesting one, but my question is this. Um, I've read an article once, some time ago, that uh, the, the, the author, well, I can't remember who now, but the author argues that all this hatred, all these slanderings, all these uh, 
labels towards Muslims is not really because of the religion. It's because of this um, economic control that they wish to set upon the world. So it's just that I just want to, to, to see your view on this one. Thank you. So everybody, my name is Muhammad Iskandar bin Daud from the uh, Teacher Institute of Higher Education, Kota Baru. The brother asked a question that he read an article where the author said that, you know, all these allegations, etc., against Islam is mainly to get control of the Muslim wealth, etc. And the person is right to a great extent. To a great extent, right, what you find, you know, the allegation what we know about the weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq. We know there were no weapons of mass destruction. There was an excuse to attack and to take control of the oil wells. So they do fabrication. And unfortunately, most of our Muslims, we sit quiet. If we Muslims unite as one force, no one will be able to bully us. But we Muslims have internal differences. Each one thinks, you know, okay, I am secure, so if my neighboring Muslim country is being attacked, no problem. They don't know the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if your Muslim brother is hurt, it is like one part of your body being hurt. And when something happens to the body, in your body all the cells go to fight. If you have a cut in the finger, all the cells, they'll go to fight and try and cure that part. <coughs> so the ummah is like a body. And they are trying the level best, which we'll discuss tomorrow more in detail. Tomorrow the topic was on Islamophobia. You know, Islamophobia, they want to create that fear so that they can attack, they can have restrictions on Muslims, not because that Islam is killing people, no. It is for other reasons we'll discuss tomorrow. So I do agree that many a time that we have today in the media and people that talk about Islam is mainly to have control of the Muslim wealth, whether it be oil, otherwise. And this is the main reason tomorrow, inshallah, we'll discuss in detail on the topic Islamophobia. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to go to... I prefer we have one, one question from our sister, from non-Muslim. Do we have a non-Muslim? You are the first preference to ask the questions. Please put forward your question. Non-Muslim, any non-Muslim would like to put up question, please? No? Otherwise, we go for the second session. Yes, please state your name and your profession and put forward your question, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Muhammad Adi bin Muhammad Sa'ad. I'm an officer from the Office of Chief Minister of Kelantan. I would like to ask Doctor a question. Okay, recently, Indian government has deleted Article 370 from its constitution due to the misconceptions upon our uh, uh, Kashmir, towards the uh, state of Kashmir. Resulting, Kashmir has no more autonomy power to regulate its affairs. Some say that it will become the next Palestine. I hope that uh, it, should be, uh, it should not be happened. So, what is your comments about this uh, particular issue? And then how, as we, as state government and people of Malaysia and a brother in Islam towards Kashmir people to react on this particular issue? Thank you very much, Doctor. As far as the, dishes, the decision taken by Indian government recently, by the BJP government, especially Narendra Modi, is to re repeal or cancel constitutional. It's unconstitutional. Because you know that Kashmir was independent land. When the partition took place between India and Pakistan, Kashmir became a part with having clauses. It's independent and no one can buy any property there. No one can become a citizen. All these clauses were there, which slowly, slowly, many of the clauses were not followed. Now the main clause of 370, they want to repeal it and they want to make it into a union territory which is unconstitutional, but there is a law in the government that if you have two-third majority in the upper house and the lower house, if you have majority, 
in the Rajya Sabha and the Lok Sabha, you can change the constitution. That is the reason they are changing now, which have many repercussions. What should be done? I believe that the Muslims all over the world should object to it and put as much as pressure as possible to undo this. And as you said rightly, that they are doing something what similar happened in what happened in Palestine. And Palestine, we know it belonged to the Muslims, to the Palestinians. During the war, they gave the Jews a just shelter. They gave them shelter and they took away the full house. And now when the Palestinians are crying that give back a house, you're calling Palestinians a terrorist. Same thing is happening in Kashmir. And you know, they're trying to do a survey of which model works. And if they think that the Palestinian model worked, but at least for the Palestinian cause, Alhamdulillah, to a great extent, the Muslims were united. Not that we could protect it completely, but Alhamdulillah, to a great extent, we were united. But the other issues, we are not. I don't know how far will the Muslim countries react to this. But logically speaking, Islamically speaking, all the Muslim countries should unite and try and protect the rights of the Kashmiris. All, should, all the Muslim countries should unite. Will they or not? Allah wala. Seeing the situation of the Muslim that we are today, we are going far and far away from the Quran and the Sunnah. We are more bothered about maintaining our seat, our chair, our position, our power, rather than following Allah and His Rasul. The day we follow Allah and His Rasul, we secure our seat in Jannah. And the topic yesterday was Quran, the path to happiness. And I said that securing a seat in Jannah is more, is more important than securing a seat in this world. This seat that you have in the world is temporary. You are like a traveler, the Prophet said. Unfortunately, the state of the Muslim Ummah is, is very pathetic. Very pathetic. We aren't raising the voice. And we came to know about the Uyghur Muslims. Today, the Muslims that are harassed the most in the world, according to me, it's not the Palestinian, it is the Chinese Uyghur Muslims. That Muslims in the Xinjiang area. And according to the reports of various human organizations, and various organizations for human rights, they say one to two million Muslim, Uyghur Muslim in China, they have been imprisoned in concentration camps, <clears throat> which they call as education camps. And they started in 2015. Previously, the harassment was less. It came in the light to the public, to some of the human rights organizations in 2017, was known to the world in starting 2015. 17, 2016, they came to know, and now it is more common, so common that many of the human rights organizations objected, and recently, last month, in July, there were 22 countries who objected to the violation of human rights in China. And do you know, out of the 22 countries, not a single country was a Muslim-majority country. Not a single. 22, most of them European countries, 100% non-Muslim countries, they laid an objection in the UN, United Nations, against China for violation of human rights. Shocking, not a single Muslim country. Some give the example, we don't know. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> that news was not as bad as the news I got after a few days. The news we get after a few days that 37 countries, 37 countries, and wrote a letter to UN that China is not violating the human rights. They are doing counter-terrorism. They are right. 37 countries. And the shocking part of it is, little, le little less than 50% of these countries, they were Muslim-majority countries. About 15 to 16 Muslim countries out of 37 countries, majority country, they wrote a letter to UN. What China is doing is right. 
they are torturing the Muslims. It's not torture. It's good education, re-education camp. I can understand that some, most of the Muslim, 100 percent all, not most, all the Muslim country was scared because China is a superpower. Can understand that China is a superpower. So if we speak, there may be economic embargo, etc., etc. A beloved prophet said, "If you see something wrong, number one." If you can stop it with your hand, stop it with your hand. Number two, if you cannot stop with the hand, at least stop with the tongue. If you cannot stop with the tongue, at least curse in your heart. And if you curse in your heart, you will be the lowest level of mu'min believer. Can say maybe all these Muslim countries, you know, they are scared and all. So maybe they did not object. Maybe Allah will forgive them. Allah Allah. Maybe, Allah Allah. But later on, about 16 Muslim countries agreeing with the haram activity, Allah will never forgive them. Good news is, Alhamdulillah, Malaysia is not one of those countries who said that China is right. We can understand that China is a powerful country. Maybe you could not object. Allah will forgive. Alhamdulillah, Malaysia did not sign the letter that what China is doing is right. So they are quiet. Believe me, if you fear Allah, you will not fear anyone else. The problem is the Muslims fear other people more than Allah. <clears throat> if you know that our main destination is Akhirah, our main destination is that we have to go to Jannah, the problem is we are not good businessmen. I would like to give you the example of Abu Darda. May Allah be pleased with him. That once, when a new Muslim was making a house boundary for himself, the neighbor, the Jewish house, in his house was a date palm tree coming into the house of that new Muslim. So he could not build the wall. And the Jewish said, you dare touch my tree. And there was a big problem, so he came to the Prophet. That, you know, this neighbor's Jewish tree is coming in the way. I cannot build the boundary. So the Prophet calls the Jew and tells him that if you let this date palm grow, give it to him. I will give you one tree in Jannah. The Jew said, are you crazy? <laughs> I don't want it. I'm happy with my date palm here. So Abu Darda, may Allah be pleased with him, he owned one of the best gardens of date palm in Medina. He goes to the Prophet and asks him that if I can get the date palm tree for that Muslim, will I get a date palm tree in Jannah? The Prophet says, yes, of course. So Abu Darda, goes to that Jew and tells me that do you know who you am? Who am I? He says, no, I don't know who you are. I'm Abu Darda. Ah, Abu Darda that owns one of the best date palm tree in Medina. Yeah, what can I do for you? He gives them an offer that if you give me this one date palm tree, I will give you my full garden, 100%. The Jewish said, are you crazy? I said, no. Wallah, I will give it to you. So he said, okay. So he said, fine. He gets that tree and gives it to that new Muslim. And he goes and tells his wife that today I have clicked a deal. I said, what have you done? He says that I have exchanged our full garden of date palm for one tree in Jannah. And the reply of the wife was, ah, what a deal. Today people will say, you're crazy. You should have given half the garden. Surely in half the garden also that Jew would have given the tree. Yes or no? Yes or no? Even if he had given quarter garden, he would have given that one tree. But the wife replies of Abu Darda, ah, what a deal you have clicked. Today's wife will say, fool, idiot. 
Okay, you want a tree in Janna? Give quarter garden. Why full garden? Because they knew the value of Janna. Imagine they're giving up all the wealth and the, and the Sira tells us of the Sahaba that till the end of his life he lived in poverty, not that he had wealth. He gave his full wealth away for one tree in Janna. This is the Iman that the Sahabas had. His full wealth only for one tree in Janna, which you could have even given quarter and you would have got it. And the wife agrees, what a deal. So today, unfortunately, we are so afraid. We are so possessive of our wealth, so possessive of our things. Imagine when our Muslim brothers are dying, they are being killed, they are being tortured. In China, at least in Palestine, they can pray openly. In Palestine, they can fight openly, they can do jihad openly. They can fast. In China, these Shing and Muslims, most of them aren't allowed to pray. They aren't allowed to fast. They are forced to drink alcohol in Ramadan. If you object, they put you in concentration camp called as re-education camps. What are we doing? There's so much of evidence available. Some countries say we Muslim countries say we don't have evidence. So what we realize that we Muslims, we haven't understood the real value, which is gold. If we follow the Quran and the seed of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we'll be in a much better position. The happiness that we'll get in our life, which we discussed yesterday, is tremendous. The problem is we don't read the Quran, we don't understand the Quran, we don't read the Hadith, we don't implement on it. Happiness doesn't come by wealth. Happiness doesn't come by position. Happiness doesn't come by power. Happiness doesn't come by gold. It comes with the satisfaction in your heart and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are in a very pathetic situation and history is repeating itself. Now they are doing it in India, when they could do it in Palestine, what are the Muslims doing? They're in China, what are the Muslims doing? So what do we expect the Muslims to do when they're doing it in India? I can talk. So I'm talking. I knew that I talked in India and high chances I'll be thrown out. Okay. At least I stayed for 25 years. I thought it would be much more earlier. Alhamdulillah. We are doing it for our Jannah Akhirah. Why aren't the Muslims united on this issue? I'm talking about the Islamic issue. I'm not a politician. I don't do involved in the politics. But we Muslims should unite. And Alhamdulillah, one of the reasons that according to me, amongst the Muslim countries in the world, one of the best countries available in the world is Malaysia. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Malaysia continue being the best. We always saw Malaysia fighting for the Palestinian rights, fighting for the Rohingya rights. We hope it continues. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give the Malaysian the guts and the power. It's a small country, no problem. But if you have the power of Allah, it becomes the most powerful country. But if you want Allah on your side, then you'll become the powerful country. If you don't Allah on your side, you won't become powerful. So to make it the most powerful country, who do you require? Allah on your side. So if you follow the commandment of Allah and follow the commandment of beloved prophet in the hadith, you'll become the most powerful country. But if you have faith in Allah, I chose to live in Malaysia because amongst the various, I had offers from about 15 countries. I feel Malaysia amongst, you could say, best of the worst or best available, whatever you want to say, among the Muslim countries. We have 56 majority Muslim countries. I chose that it is good, it's away from the war zone. No, it's not like you see Gulf countries, Yemen, Syria, war zone. Number two, it doesn't have so much of pressure from the Western countries, like the other Muslim countries. 
Number three, it's the country which has the most powerful Muslim passport. 180 countries you can travel without visa. I don't know if all of you, some may be knowing, all may not be keeping track of it. You go to the Henley's passport, 180 countries without visa. It's an advanced country. It's a country where the federal religion is Islam. You have about two-thirds Muslims living. It's good. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may the Muslims of Malaysia be united. If you are united, you are a stronger force. If you are divided, you'll become weak. So my only advice or suggestion to Muslims all over the world, including Muslims of Malaysia, for Allah's sake, let your differences aside, and for the cause of Islam, we should unite. And this has been my message always for all the Muslims. If we are united, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, Hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. So if we unite, the best criteria where we can unite is on the basis of Quran. Whatever the Quran says, at least that is the common factor of Muslims throughout the world. Whether you live in West, East, Arab country, non-Arab country, this is the uniting factor. And inshallah, if we, if we have this uniting factor, there will not be situation like Palestine or China or India 370, what happened in Afghanistan, what happened in Iraq. And I was happy in Iraq. I was happy that, mashallah, there was, like we have the International Court of Law in Hague, a similar one was started in Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur war crimes, KLWC. And in, I think in the year 2011, if I'm not mistaken, it was started by Sun Dr. Mahathir, and they had the guts and, alhamdulillah, the courage that they had a tribunal of five judges, they had lawyers from different parts of the world, and they put to trial the previous president of USA, George Bush, and the previous president of UK, Tony Blair. And, alhamdulillah, I really admired the guts. No Muslim country had the guts, but Malaysia had the guts. In the war crime tribunal, they laid and they said the people responsible for fabricating evidence is the former president of USA, George Bush and Tony Blair. If they set foot in Malaysia, we will arrest them. MashaAllah. Malaysia small country had the guts to challenge the superpower with the help of Allah and they did it later on five years later 2016 in UK the Chircot report they say that America and UK fabricated evidence to show that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction to attack Iraq so what does Tony Blair come and says it is I am very sorry, I regret, the most act I regret ever in my life is this act. That's it. Sorry. You know, more than a million people died, thousands of people in the war, and because of the sanction, millions of children died, and adults died because of sanctions. Only sorry. At least Malaysia, they had the KLWC, Kuala Lumpur war crime, alhamdulillah. I wish such more tribunals are set up here. And if they can object same way with China, if they can object same thing with India, and all the, we cannot, I'm not telling you do violently. Okay, at least have such, you have the KLWC. Okay, there you can do it. I mean, my suggestion. At least you can say one Muslim country in the world, the non-Muslim 22 countries, maybe some may be having benefit or some agenda, whatever it is. At least they stood for the truth. Similarly, what's happening in India? In India, we Muslim the minority, according to government, 14.5%. 
Muslims say we are about 20-25%, but if we agree with 14.5% also, the, here are the non-Muslims, the Hindus are 6.3%, 6.4%. The Hindus in Malaysia get more than 100 times more rights than the Muslims in India. Good, alhamdulillah, I'm not saying take away their rights. Good, this is what Muslims should do. They are half the percentage, numbers wise very less, half the percentage of India, where Muslims are. <clears throat> Yet the rights they get here is 100 times more than what India gives rights to minority. So much so that they support the Prime Minister of India but not Prime Minister of Malaysia. MashaAllah. The Prime Minister of India wants me. The Prime Minister of Malaysia does not want injustice to be done to me. The Hindu Malaysians are most of them supporting Prime Minister of India. There is no evidence about me in the Malaysian police. Interpol says no evidence. They are believing more in India. They are more Indian than the Malaysian themselves. And yet they are enjoying, Alhamdulillah, at least the Muslims should get their rights. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give more hikmah, more courage to Malaysia to voice out for the rights of the Muslims throughout the world. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, ladies. This is 30 minutes past 11, and we still have lots of time to go for the Q&A session. And I'd like to stimulate the audience to more eagerness to show your support to Dr. Zakir to give out more questions, insyaAllah. So, tuan-tuan dan perempuan, saya jemput semua ya, supaya bersemangat untuk mengambil bahagian dalam mengemukakan persoalan kerana jarang-jarang kita dapat bersama dengan seorang tokoh dunia untuk sesi soal jawab. Jadi, jangan teragak-agak untuk bertanya kerana masa yang diberikan, kita ada lebih kurang satu jam lagi untuk ditamatkan acara. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, go to the next station we have from the ladies' side. From the third station, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yeah, please put up your name first and your profession and go to the point. Thank Assalamualaikum you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang, um, Mr. Zaki Naim. My name is uh, Dr. Selasawati Ghazali. I'm a medical uh, doctor. So my, question, my concern is uh, regarding the misconceptions. It is not only for the non-Muslim, but basically it's more for the Muslim themselves. Basically, many of Muslim were genetically born Muslim. I think the lack of practice obviously there. So that's why a lot of issues being discussed because we ourselves don't understand. And this is again we're coming back to the united issues and unable to be togetherness in, in facing issues. That's divided. And I, I think this is not only in Malaysia but also in the rest of the world. Until we come up with uh, common things in common, then we can sit together, discuss together, and we can make the difference. And we know that differences um, all over, we found differences that this is not good for us. This is really not helping us to fight against many, many things. So if you can tell us, you know, and, and especially with the issues where the non-Muslim or other peoples doing something which is uh, slandering on the prophets themselves and we Muslims just keep quiet about it and we just like helpless not able to defend Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and left alone the, the, the religious itself I, I need sir. your comment on that and also <coughs> what what do you think which strength could we have you know because many of us uh, feel very sad about it but we are just hand tied thank you this is a very good question and a very important question that Muslims are born, they're born in Muslim families, they may not know some teachings of Islam, there are differences, it's not in Malaysia, it is all over the world and we find that non-Muslims are taking advantage, how can we unite? What is the strategy, what is the force that can unite the Muslims? Sister, the only force, the only thing that can unite the Muslims all over the world, whether you come from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Saudi Arabia, whether from America, from UK, or India. It is a glorious Quran. 
And I said this in my earlier answer also. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 103, Hold to the rope of Allah strongly. The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran and the authentic Hadith. Hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. We may have different cultures, no problem. We may have different languages, no problem. We may have different parties, no problem. But when it comes to Islam, all the Muslims should unite under one banner of Islam and call ourselves Muslims and follow Allah and His Rasul. Whenever any issue comes, the problem is that we have not made Quran as our source of guidance. And I know that Quran is the most widely read book in the world. But unfortunately, it is also the most widely read book without understanding. The Quran was not only sent for reciting. Yes, you'll get your sawab, you should recite in Arabic, good. But besides that, you should understand what it says. To understand, if you know Arabic, it's the best. If you don't know Arabic, read it in the language you understand the best. If you know Malay, read it in Malay. If you know English, read it in English. If you know Urdu, read it in Urdu. Read it in the language you understand the best and implement on it. If you read the Quran, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 28, that in the remembrance of Allah, do the hearts find contentment. Verily, the hearts find contentment in the remembrance of Allah. So if you read the Quran and understand it, you will come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will come closer to the Muslims all over the world. The uniting factor is the glorious Quran. Your courage will come from the Quran and from the Sahih Hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Unfortunately, we depend more on other sources. Yes, you know, here I find many people, mashallah, PhD, and all over the Muslim world. Good. Alhamdulillah. There's no harm in education. Educate yourself. The first guidance given by Allah. But see to it that there is something, education which is fard and one which is fard kifaya. Fard for every Muslim is basic education of Islam. Fard. You may not be a mufassir, you may not be a muhaddith. That is fard kifaya. To be a doctor is not a fard. That's fard kifaya. To be an engineer is not a fard. If some of them among you are, that is sufficient. For the Ayn is the basic knowledge of Islam. It is the message of the Quran. We find today, sister, you gave a generic question, and my reply is generic also, that various problems that you have, you show me what, what solution is not there in the Quran for the problem that we are facing today. Every problem that is there in the world today, Quran has a solution. And Allah guides not the Fasik people. Allah is telling in this verse of the Quran of Surah Tawbah, the only surah which begins without Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah is giving a warning to the Muslims that if you love your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives and husbands, your relatives, the wealth they have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live, if you love all these things more than Allah, more than His Rasul, then wait until Allah destroys you. And that's what's happening to us. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Muhammad chapter number 47 verse number 38 Allah says yes tabdil common gairukum summa laikunam salakum if you do not do your job if you turn away from Allah Allah will substitute in a place another people summa laikunam salakum and they will not be like you you know Allah had chosen first the Jews as the chosen people majority of the prophets almost all except a few mentioned in the Quran they were Jewish prophets they thought they were superior. Allah told them to deliver the message. They didn't deliver. So Allah says, yes, stop the common salakum. If you do not do a job, Allah will substitute your place. And other people, they will not be like you. And what does Allah do? The Jews looked down upon the Arabs at the most ignorant people. It was called as Yom al Jahiliya. The Arabs used to do tawaf around the Kaaba naked. Most jahil people. What does Allah do? Allah picks up the people who you look down upon and make them sit on the head. After reading the Quran, the Muslim became the torchbearer of the world. Muslims were on top of the world. Today, we are in number, but we are at the bottom of the world. Why? That time we were close to Quran and Sunnah. 
Quran made us go on top of the world. Today, we are far away from Quran and Sunnah. So if you do not do your job, Allah will substitute you. Yes, And they will not be like you. So Allah doesn't require us the rubbish that we are. Do you think Allah requires me to make Islam prevail? I will be the biggest fool in the world if I start thinking I must die and Islam is spreading because of me. Biggest fool. Allah is giving us an opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. Allah can do it within a fraction of a second. Does it require us? Do you think Allah cannot make the problem solve in Palestine or Kashmir or China? Allah is testing us Muslims. For Allah to do, kun fa kun. Very easy. But Allah is testing us. We are undergoing the test. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mul, chapter number 16, verse number 2, Allah di khalaq al mawta wal hayata. Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. For Allah to solve this, and Allah has promised that. Allah says clearly in the Quran in no less than three different places. Allah says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 34. Allah says in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. And Surah Saf, chapter number 16, verse number 9. Allah says, Who al the earth al rasul wa bilodah wa din al haq li uzhira wa la dine kulle wa la qadil mushikun. Allah sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religion, over all the other ism, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, secularism, atheism, socialism. Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulle. Master them all. And Allah says, However much the mushi don't like it. And one place Allah says, Wakafa billahi shayda. And enough is Allah is a witness. Allah does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Do you think Allah requires you and me? No. He is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and to earn a prophet's reward. Do dawa. At least speak. <coughs> and it is mentioned in the Sahih Hadith that finally Islam will prevail. It's the promise of Allah in the Quran. And we will rule the world for seven years. We don't know whether we live till that time. These are the Akhir Zama, the signs of the last hour. That's a big topic by itself. Allah is testing us in this position. What should we do as individuals? I am not the king of a country. I am not the prime minister or the president. What can I do? I as a Muslim actually follow the Quran. Allah will not question you that why did you do this or do that. Allah will question you what you are, how did you do or not. The least we can do is pray for our Muslims in China, for our Muslims in Palestine, for the Muslims in India. The least you can do is you can speak. What Allah has given you capacity, do that at least. What Allah has not given you capacity, Allah will not question you. Allah will question those people who Allah has given capacity. If I have the, if Allah has given me the technique of speaking, Alhamdulillah, and if I don't speak, Allah will take away my speech. So we sister number one should see to it that we at least on the straight path. Because many a times Muslim talk, but when they get in that position, they do the same thing what the others are doing. Because now we are not in position, you say we should do this, we should do that. When you get to the position, you are worse than the person who was there before you. This is what's happening throughout the world. To come to power, you will say you will follow Allah, you will follow Quran. When you come to power, you are the first person to go away from Allah and His Rasul. Why? So a Muslim should unite. Whatever you can do, sister, whether on the social media, whether on the WhatsApp, whether on the Facebook, whether on the Twitter, uh, Twitter, whether on the Instagram, whatever way, you see to it that you pray for these people, Allah is sufficient for them, and what action you do, what you can contribute with your time, with your money, with your energy, with your ability, and the Muslim, he is not feeding his neighbor and talking about other things. Why aren't they doing in that part of the world? And if Allah has given you money, at least help your neighbor, that you can do. That you're not doing and you're talking about other things. Good. So see to it that you don't fall in the same position. 
I as a Muslim don't fall in the same position where Allah has given me authority. I'm not helping my other Muslim brothers. I'm not helping my non-Muslim neighbors. The Prophet said, a Muslim is not a true Muslim. A person who eats his tummy full and his neighbors are hungry. And the Prophet said, 40 houses next to you is your neighbor. So we know today there is a lot of test for the Muslims. Unfortunately, most of us are not close to Quran Sunnah. I advise all the Muslim brothers and sisters, at least you see that you are following your immediate responsibility, number one, of Salah, of Zakat, of Hajj, of Ramadan, immediate responsibility, most important. It will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Read the Quran with translation, implement it. Then whatever you can do, keep on doing more and more. And Allah, inshallah, the more what Allah has given you, you do, then Allah will give you more. I was a stammerer. I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world. I could never have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. Inspired by Sheikh Ahmed Dida, started speaking. MashaAllah, now addressing 100,000, 1 million people. Alhamdulillah. I'm in I am no, this is a miracle. People know me that I used to stammer in my childhood. So it's all from Allah. It's nothing about my own. It is Allah who has given me. Otherwise, we are zero. So my advice to the Muslim Ummah is that let the Muslim unite on the basis of Quran and Sunnah. As much as you can do, keep on doing and continue striving. Whether you get results or not is secondary, stick to the Quran and Sunnah. Inshallah, you'll enter Jannah. Hope that answers the question, sir. Alhamdulillah. What an amazing explanation from Dr. Zakir. Alhamdulillah, Allah has granted him with his superior knowledge about Islam. Thank you very much, doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to go to one more question on the station number four. Dan untuk pengetahuan anda ya, saya dapat maklumat ramai yang nak bertanya tapi malu nak tanya dalam English. So kita boleh gunakan bahasa Malaysia. So you can ask in bahasa Melayu, you can ask in Mandarin, you can ask in Thailand, in whatever language. Inshallah, we have the best translators here to project your question to the Zakir. So may I have another question from station number four, please, ladies. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Nurul Fauzi Hanif Binti Jailani and I'm a student from uh, UITM. Nervous. <laughs> okay, so um, my question is, if a person sometimes doesn't believe the existence, the existence of God in her entire life, but somehow when her last breath, she receives shahada, does she go to heaven? Is it as simple as that? I mean, thank you. The sister has a question that if someone doesn't believe in the existence of God for the full life, but in the last breath says the Shada, will she go to Jannah, will he go to Jannah? Sister, it depends what do you mean by last breath. Because last breath means if the Malkal moth has come and if you're dying, if you have seen death coming towards them, then you say the shahada is not accepted. And Firon in the Quran, it says, he was a taqut, he used to call himself God. When he was drowning, he said, this believe in Allah, too late. Do you think he'll go to heaven? No. So last moment means maybe a few days before dying, no problem. If the death approaches you, and you can see death coming, and then you face a shahada, it's too late. But maybe a few days before dying, or maybe the death hasn't approached, and you say the shahada, and you may die the next minute, no problem. As long as the death hasn't approached you, then if you say the shahada, and it will take you to Jannah, because the moment a non-Muslim agrees that he bears witness there's no God but Allah, and he believes that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, all his previous sins are forgiven. And there's a hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's a hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, that the Prophet said, that there is a person who does full life good deeds, deeds of Jannah, until he's one arm's length to Jannah. And at the last moment, he does deeds of Jahannam and he goes to Jahannam. And the Prophet continues, there's a person who does full life deeds of Jahannam, 
until he is one arm's length away from Jahannam, hell. And he does good deed, deeds of Jannah, and he goes to Jannah. So, therefore, we pray that may Allah make us die on Iman. That's more important. Dying on Iman is more important. Best in living and dying on Iman. Inna salati wa nusuki wa maya wa mati of the Quranic verse of Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 162, that this life, a prayer, a sacrifice, our life and death is for Allah. That is the best. But between the two, earlier part or latter part, the latter part is more important. And anyone who accepts the Shahada, the Prophet said, all his previous sins are forgiven. The good deeds are kept, all his sins are forgiven, as though he's newborn. So if someone who doesn't believe in Allah the full life, before dying, if he accepts Islam, if she accepts Islam, inshallah they'll go to Jannah. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Any non-Muslims who would like to put forward a question for the Tazakir? You are the first preference. You can jump up the queue and go to the microphone to ask any questions. Any non-Muslim here? Okay, I go, we go to another station. We come again to the first station on my left, on the gentleman station. I'd like to welcome gentlemen. Please forward to the microphone for your question, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dr. Zak Zakir Naik and salam sejahtera to the all audience. Uh, before I, actually I, my name is Zainuddin bin Haji Sulaiman, working as a bookkeeper in the Accountant General Department of Malaysia. Uh, Actually, during my further studies abroad in first Australia, uh, at that time I felt sick, so I was got treatment inside the hospital there. Uh, while I was uh, in the hospital, come to my mind, I want to uh, my, make my own. I mean, I, I want to 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 know what is inside the Australian people mind or their heart regarding the life of the death. Okay, I write on the piece of paper uh, beginning, beginning with the after the number one it's not two but one point zero 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 and never reach to Number two, that's only serve as an introduction. And now this is the, the, the real question. Where we are going after this? A, heaven, B, paradise, C, hell. Brother, I, sorry, brother, I mean, I cannot understand some of your words. Most oh. of it I can. What you said before, 1.000, that I didn't understand. You said life after death. So can you repeat the part which you said before 1.000? Uh, I mean, uh, just, uh, I don't know how to explain. Just to give him, to show that there is something in the world that we could not understand. That's why I said, for example. There are many things in the world we don't understand. What's the question? Can you come to the question directly? Okay, you are giving okay. background, everything. Question, brother, okay. as the chairman said. Actually, question should be one or two sentences. If it's more yes. than two sentences, it becomes a lecture. I am giving lecture here. Fine? <laughs> question to the point. Your name and question. Yes. Background, okay. I don't sorry. want. Only sorry, question. Sorry. Yes, brother. Sorry, sorry. And then he took pen from me, and he's not straight away pick up the answer for a few minutes, and then he wrote the answer himself. He put the, the another choice. Brother, can you start, please, can you start the question afresh in short two sentences? Okay. From start, only question, no background. I asked him. Who, uh, who him? The, the staff of the Start hospital. the question from again, brother, from now. There's no him, only me and you are there. 
uh, where we are going after this. I ask him, A, heaven, B, paradise, C, hell. And then he doesn't agree with all the three. He put himself, D, others. That's only the question for you to maybe can describe why he cannot, cannot, cannot agree with one of three of my choice. He gave another with me others. Jesus. Brother, you asked a question to someone. <laughs> he gave a wrong answer. You want me to give, ask me why he gave a wrong answer. You know him, I don't know him. Who is the him I don't know? You are telling me question asked A, B, C, D. He chose D. Why he chose D? What do I know? I am not, I don't have Ilme Gap. So your question is not at all making any sense. So can we have the next question? He has been to Australia many times. Memang saya tanya pun dia dalam bahasa Inggeris sebab dia orang Australia. Saya, saya sedang di, I was admitted in the hospital. So I take chance to make my own survey uh, to the Australian people. How their assumption regarding life after death. That's actually the beginning, the introduction. You want to know what the assumption of the Australian life after death? Yes. That's why I, uh, I most of the people in Australia don't believe in life after death. Yeah. If you want to know the reply of life uh, after death, that uh. is the 17th answer of my question. <laughs> in my 20 most common question, the 17th uh -huh. question is, can you prove life after death? So if you go on the net, there's my book available on the most common questions. You pick up the 17th answer is wrong. Now we have shortage of time. The 17th reply, how to prove life after death is given in that book. It's also available on the video. And inshallah, that will satisfy you. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, brother. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so please be aware that you have to speak clearly. Please be briefly and to the point. And no lectures and no debates on this session. Just a quick, short question to Dr. Zaki. So I go to the next session. Please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh, Dr. Zakir. My name is Muhammad Erik Zahan, Berudisham. I am an internship student from University Technology Mara, UITM Puncak Perdana, and I am from IT Department, uh, SUK. Okay, my question is, uh, Doctor, um, how do you face? the problem, the matter that you uh, that face to you nowadays and how you manage the situation and also what you feel about it. Can you give an answer so you, we, can, uh, we, can, we all can take that is, as our inspiration? Thank you, Dr. Brother, the question that what is my situation now? and how am I facing the difficulties and we want the reply so that it can give inspiration to us. Alhamdulillah, I would like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number one for all the blessings and niyama he has given us, mashallah, especially me. I wouldn't like to exchange my position with any other human being living today. You know, there are about 7.8 billion people living in the world. What niyama Allah has given me I would not like to exchange my position with any other person that I know of. Past, there are many good people present. Whether they are prime ministers, presidents, king, whatever it is, what Niyama Allah has given me is Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah. And we are undergoing a test. You may have heard in the news that because of my dawah activities in India, in 2016, they banned the organization. I was traveling abroad, I did not go back. Because we know that they lay allegations against the Muslims and by the time we prove ourselves in the court of law, we may get justice after 20 years. So I didn't want to be a dead hero. You know, we follow the guidance given by my beloved Prophet Muhammad When the life is in danger, problem, what do you do? You do hijrat. So we did hijrat. And amongst the country, there are about 
maybe 15 countries that told me you come and live here. Amongst them, I thought that Malaysia was the best, alhamdulillah. Therefore, I chose to be here. And I'm happy to be in Malaysia. My life in Malaysia is multiple times better than my life in India. There are several niyama. I had a lot of fans in India, even a lot of enemies. Here also, mashallah, I've got more fans, I've got few enemies here also, mashallah. You know, as Allah says in the Quran, that for every prophet have we kept an enemy. You know, so the da'is are the followers of the prophet, you know, trying to spread the message. So if you're a true da'i, you're bound to have enemies. This is part and parcel. It adds a spice to our life. So we shifted from India, you know, by Allah's grace, we had one of the largest private Muslim da'wah organization in the world in terms of budget, in terms of people. We had 500 people working full time for us. Now, only three, four. But I'm happy here with three, four employees. There we had 500 employees, mashallah. Largest da'wah organization, more than 10,000 volunteers. Now, mashallah. Yet the work is continuing. They are trying a level best to stop activities. One of our major activities, Peace TV. We have Peace TV in English, which was launched 13 and a half years back, having a viewership of more than 100 million, mashallah. Largest watch religious channel in the world, more than even the Christian channel. We launched the second channel, Peace TV Urdu, in 2009 which is about 10 years back, having a viewership of 80 million. We launched Peace TV Bangla in 2011, about eight years back, having a viewership of 50 million. And 2015, December, about three and a half years back, we launched Peace TV Chinese and Mandarin. And now, mashallah, the live telecast is going to all the four channels, more than 200 million viewers, mashallah. So our work is continuing. The more we do dawah, the more they're trying to pressurize us. I gave you the example of UK. Before 2010, I could travel anywhere in the world. But when they found the popularity, they found the peace TV, they found people accepting Islam. Every day, alhamdulillah, hundreds of people, Allah is giving hidayah due to peace TV. Every day. We are sitting in Malaysia, but the channel is continuing. The enemies of Islam are trying their best to, to close it. Allah does not require peace TV to spread Islam. We are thankful to Allah that is utilizing us. Allah does require us. So we are striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Life here is much better. They have taken all the property, but property will not take you to Jannah. It's good, you know, property can go in loss in business. Someone can rob, an earthquake can come, your house can get destroyed. If the kafir, the enemies of Islam have taken a property of a dai, what better thing that I can thank Allah it's been used for? We want a house in Jannah, not house in the world. So when Abu Darda could give all his wealth, so we get inspiration from the Sahaba that if this can get us Jannah, it's a very good deal. It's a very good deal. And I gave you the reasons why I chose Malaysia. We are continuing activity, alhamdulillah. And we are doing with bigger. See, the thing is, Allah doesn't see the results. Allah sees your striving. Because the result that we got, believe me, impossible. Bombay is one of the most difficult places in the world to do dawah. And when there we could have the largest conference in the world, a million people for five years, impossible. I cannot say I'm intelligent, I'm smart, no. So with whatever effort we did, the result we got is a million times than what we deserve. <coughs> now we are striving, we have to strive harder. Result comes or not, Allah gives you for your striving, not for your results. Results are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are continuing our dawah. There are people who are for us, people who are against us, most of the Muslims for us. There are some secular Muslims, there are some Munafik Muslims who are against us. All this is part and parcel of life. If you don't have this spice, we have to keep on striving. We have to keep on struggling. And we have to continue whatever we can give to the community. Whatever we can do for the spread of Islam, we are continuing. If we become silent and stop, then what's the use? So if Allah has given some ability to you, not that I wasn't aware. I thought I would have been kicked out many years back. Well, alhamdulillah, 25 years we did dawah in India, mashallah. 25 years. And Allah gave hidayah to so many people. Alhamdulillah. Your life in Malaysia, as I told you, is much better. More ibadah, more time to contemplate. With less workers, you have to do more jihad. 
Jihad means striving and struggling, yeah? not, not war. And we are doing that. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have other strategies of how to expand our activities, how to grow. Now there is social media, etc. And what we can contribute, we keep on meeting, you know, leaders of many countries in the world. Just a couple of months back, I met a prime minister of a country outside Malaysia. I gave, a, as I told you, a talk to the Interpol of one of the European countries. Alhamdulillah, when we meet, our job is to advise. With hikmah, without insulting, whenever I meet any heads of state, whether it be a chief minister, whether it be a prime minister, whether it be a president, and Allah has given the opportunity of us to meet several prime ministers and presidents of the world, mashallah. I'm nothing. When we meet, we give advice. Some of them change the full country. They, on the advice, they made me the religious advisor. They change the full country. Next year, America destroys them. You may know, you may not know their country. And he's no longer there as the president. No problem. At least the seat in Jannah is secured. They call that, I'm the godfather of that president. See, we have to keep on striving. Main thing is our we should try and secure our seat in Jannah. And that's what I'm doing. We are striving, we are struggling. And we only ask Allah that lay not on us a burden greater than we can bear. Put me in a test, where I will pass. If the test is difficult, no problem. But see to it that I can pass in the test. And Allah promises in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 2, uh, uh, 286. It's the last verse of the Quran that Allah does not lay on any person a burden greater than he can bear. <clears throat> and the more difficult the test is, the more higher is the reward. And I really would like to thank this country, Malaysia, and thank the majority of the Malaysians, mashallah, that for striving. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, get the Malaysian more closer to the Quran, more closer to Sunnah, so that all of us, inshallah, can meet in Jannah, inshallah, in Jannah the Firdaus. Hope that answers the question. Alhamdulillah. We continue with another question from the sister side on the station number three. Please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. My name is Nazrah Muhammad Saleh. I'm a teacher from Tanah Merah. Uh, the verses are from, I think it's Al-Baqarah. Maybe you can uh, through with me. La ikrah hafidin. Please interpret uh, more about la ikrah hafidin. Wallahu alam. What the sister has quoted the verse of the Quran from Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 256, which says la ikrah hafidin. But that's part of the verse, the complete verse, that there's no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. You know, many people say, like Rafidi, no compulsion in religion, therefore don't do dawah, don't preach Islam. That is not the meaning of like Rafidi. The complete verse says, like Rafidi, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. And if you grasp the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will take you from darkness to light. If you grasp the hand of the Satan, he will take you from light to darkness. That is the complete verse. That means you cannot force anyone to accept Islam at the point of the gun or the point of the sword. It's haram in Islam. But that does not mean you should not do dawah. It does not mean you should not convey the message. So this verse says you cannot force anyone physically to accept Islam. Yes, you can do dawah. You can convince him. You can argue with him. You can debate with him. No problem. But you cannot force him physically to accept Islam. That is not allowed. Because... This should be with your choice. So this verse is a very powerful verse of the Quran coming after another very powerful verse of Ayat al-Kursi. Ayat al-Kursi, Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 255, the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ayah of the throne. Then this verse starts with, like Rafidin, there's no compulsion in religion. So this verse is very important to understand that Islam is against forceful conversion. So people talk about, you know, Islam was fed by the sword. And I gave in my talk this verse that even if you had the sword, we cannot convert at the point of the sword because it is, not, it is prohibited in Islam. But at the same time, we have to convey the truth. The verse says, truth stands out clear from error. If you don't present the truth, how can you say truth stands out clear? 
That means this verse indicates that you have to present the truth and then let them make the choice. You cannot force them. It's very important for Dawah and for us to understand that Islam is against forceful conversion. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Another question, please, from the lady's side. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Doctor and members of the floor, my name is Wan Nurihan Wan Hussein, a legal officer from uh, Kota Baru Islamic City Municipal Council. I have one question. Uh, what is your opinion regarding the agnostic and atheism attacks young people Muslim in Malaysia? And what is the basic knowledge that the parents need to explore in order to overcome the problem? Thank you. Sister, the question that what is my view regarding an atheist and agnostic and what is the best way to overcome that problem? <clears throat> an agnostic is a person who does not comment about God. Neither does he say there is God, neither does he say there is no God. He doesn't say there is God, doesn't say no God, he's silent. The Buddhist actually is an agnostic religion, actually. Buddha was an agnostic. <clears throat> Why he was, that's a separate question. Atheist is a person who doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu. How you solve the problem? It's a big talk I gave in Kuala Lumpur along with the question answer session. It was for six hours. In 2016, I gave a talk, Is the Quran God's Word? Trying to prove about atheism. And that was the longest program of mine in the life. Started at about uh, 8.30, went up to about 3 o'clock in the morning. There were more than 50,000 people, mashallah. That was also in a stadium, Bukhijal Stadium. I'll just give a brief about it, and rest you can see the video cassette. Whenever I meet an atheist, the first thing I do is, I congratulate him. You may ask that, why am I congratulating an atheist? <clears throat> the reason I congratulate an atheist is, to the other people, most of the people, he's a Christian, because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Most of the Muslims are Muslim because father is a Muslim. This atheist is thinking he may be having religious parents, but he may not agree. You know, he's saying that what the people who they call God, I don't agree. So the reason I congratulate an atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La Ilaha. Half my job is done. He's already said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha. Only thing I have to do is Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. So half the job is done to a person who is a mushrik, who is of a different religion. First I have to prove to him the God is worshipping is wrong. So if I meet a Christian, first I have to prove to him that Jesus Christ, peace be upon is not God. Correct? Half my time goes there. Here the atheist has already clean set. No God. La ilaha. Only thing you have to love, which is easy. So this person, he's not blindly following his parents. He says, I don't believe that this God who can be defeated, this God who can kill, who can be killed, this God who can die, I don't believe in such a God. So I say, even I don't believe in such a God. If this is what you're killing God who requires to eat, who requires to excrete, who can be killed, who, who feels hungry, who is weak, I don't believe, la ilaha. Then I have to speak to him about the true God. If someone says Islam is a religion of terrorism, it's against science, against women, I don't believe in Islam. I said, even I don't believe in such Islam. And then I correct to him, Islam is a scientific religion, it's the most logical religion, it has rights for the woman, blah, blah, blah. And then I convince him. So for the atheist, I tell him, the best definition of God is Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul huwa Allahu ahad, say is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad, Allah the absolute eternal. Lam yirid wa lam yulad, he begets not nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufu an ahad, there's nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given in the glorious Quran. Any person says that so-and-so candidate is worshipping his God, if that candidate fits in the four-line definition, we have no problem in accepting that person as God. So this Surah Ikhlas is the litmus test of theology. Theo means God, logic means study, study of God. Our beloved Prophet said it is one third of the Quran. So once you explain the right concept of Allah, <clears throat> Inshallah he will accept 
There are various ways. There's other way called logical ways. There's another way, scientific ways. There are different ways of trying to prove to an atheist. All this you can find in my talk, Is the Quran God's Word? Along with question and session for about six and a half hours. Inshallah, it will help you to get replies to most of the queries and how to speak to atheists and agnostic. Hope that answers the question. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the third round of the Q&A sessions, and I go again to the first station here. Please, gentlemen, your question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is uh, Noor Shakiman bin Muhammad. I'm an engineer by training. Honorable Dr. Zakir, my question is on da'wah. I think you have spoken about da'wah and a couple of questions about it already. But please forgive me. Uh, first and foremost, I appreciate what you and your group are doing or have done. And you just mentioned in your speeches or your speeches now that uh, Islam is the fastest growing religion in Europe or in UK, in USA, and Europe at large. But unfortunately, it is not happening in this region or in Asian region, or there isn't known to most of us. Some even say that the reverse is happening. Is it anything to do with economic situation of the people in this region? Is it because the way we practice Islam is far from the real Islam? Is it because the akhlaq of some of the Muslims in the region are not attracting our non-Muslim brothers or sisters to Islam? Even though we have, or my questions have a lot of question marks, but essentially it's only one question. We love our non-Muslim brothers, we love our non-Muslim sisters, and we want them to be Muslims like us. And before that, before you answer, please accept my salam, or salam from my son, who is a new star in Sabah. Thank you. Wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The brother asked a question that Islam is the fastest growing religion, and, and as I said, that is the fastest growing religion in Europe in America, but he's saying, unfortunately, in this part of the world, he's talking about Southeast Asia. In this part of the world, it is not the fastest going, it is reverse. I'm sorry to say I disagree with you. I said Islam is the fastest religion throughout the world. The percentage there may be more, but even in Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, including Indonesia, including almost all the countries, Islam is the fastest going religion. Even in Malaysia, it is the fastest growing religion. I have given personal talks, and in my talks, you know, in that Bukit Jalil Stadium, about 21 people accepted Islam. One by one, uh, and group is separate, one by one. How many people ask me question out of the people that ask me question? 21 accepted Islam. So where you are saying it is not? I know so many reward centers. I have got so many students here, mashallah, who have got dawah centers, and Every day they're accepting Islam. So I don't know which statistics are you talking about. The percentage may differ here and there. That is the reason, you know, many people in Malaysia, they don't want me, why? Because they don't want Islam to spread. Those who want me to stay, they want Islam to spread. You know, everyone doesn't want Islam to spread. So those who don't want Islam to spread, there may be some secular Muslims. There may be some... Uh, non-practicing Muslim, they may be a group of non-Muslim, but generally even the non-Muslim love me. In India, majority of the non-Muslim loved me. It was the political influence non-Muslims for the World Bank, they maligned me. Otherwise, most of the Hindus, they love me. So because they wanted to break that, they created this you know, Islamophobia about terrorism, hate speech. And the judge in the tribunal court, Alhamdulillah, happened to be a Sikh. So when they went to attach my property, they attached the property. Then the higher court, we filed in the higher court. His name is Justice Manmohan. He said that I have seen the lectures of Dr. Zakir. Get me one sentence only. 
out of context from any of his speeches which promote terrorism, I will attach all his properties. That the media doesn't say, maybe it came as short news, only few people saw. So which is more important? The allegation laid by the police is more important than the judgment given by judge is more important. Huh? The job of the police is not to give judgment. Job of the police is to catch the right person. They catch the wrong person. Therefore, I said, I have faith in the judiciary system, but not the prosecution system. Prosecution means they can keep you in jail for 20 years, and the judge after 20 years says you are innocent. 20 years gone. So coming back to your question, in India, mashallah, it comes in Southeast Asia. Every day, many people accepting Islam. Many people, alhamdulillah. Many. This doesn't go down the throat very well. Of mainly those people who are politically motivated. So here also, most of the people who don't want me, they're politically motivated. Some are good politicians, most of them want me. Most of the politicians want me. Those who may not be in favor of Islam, who don't want Islam to spread, they don't want me. Those who want Islam to spread, they want me. So this is going, the, 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 the tussle between the good and evil is going to be there. It's part and parcel. It's part and parcel, mashallah. And, and never, mashallah, has anyone told me not to give speeches, whether it was the previous government, whether it was the present government, alhamdulillah. I am good with all the Muslims. My job is as a dai. And here, mashallah, Malaysia is a good scope. Mashallah. It is ingrained in the constitution of Malaysia, according to my study, that no non-Muslim can do dawah to the Muslim. It's not allowed by law. Mashallah. Very good. But a Muslim can do dawah. That is the constitution. That's the different thing the non-Muslim the object to me. That's the different question. But by law, in Malaysia, according to the constitution, a Muslim can do dawa to anyone in Malaysia, Muslim and non-Muslim. But a non-Muslim cannot do dawa to a Muslim. Good constitution, because Islam is the only religion which is right, according to the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19. So Islam is spreading here. Yes, it should spread faster, that's a different question. That's a different question. How to do it, that's a different question. Whether you do it or not, Islam will prevail over the full world. What we have to do, we have to have more dawa centers, we have to have deal with more hikmah, have training centers, speak with them with reason, with logic, with love. Now, once you start getting effective, your enemies will grow. The most effective person, the most popular person in the world is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The maximum enemy is anyone in the world is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Quran says, Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 24, verse number 30, for every prophet we appointed an enemy. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the last prophet. He has got an enemy. He has to have. So this is part and parcel of the Muslim. But do with hikmah. Do not break the rules of the Quran. Let them, let the other people be violent. At least we should not be. We should continue. We want to show the mercy and the love of Islam. That's the reason we continue doing our work. I never normally get involved in the brick bats. You know. That will hamper my dawah work. Let them bark those who want to bark. We have to continue, be on the straight path, and do our work peacefully, convey the message. You know, most of the non-Muslims I met personally, they love me, you know. Uh, when I stayed in Putrajaya, I had gone to a medical clinic, I had a medical problem, and I saw a name of a Muslim on top. I went there and the person recognized me, oh, Dr. Zakir, and I thought that he was Muslim. And then I said, no, no, we won't take money from you. How can I take money from Dr. Zakir? He gave me his card, he turned out to be Hindu. In Malaysia. I go to a Chinese, he recognized me, oh, are you Dr. Zakir? I said, yes, oh, come, come, sit. No fees. So most of the non-Muslims in Malaysia are so very good like India. Those people who are making noise, all are politically motivated. All. The non-Muslims I meet, they are so good to me. They say, can I take a photograph with you? Now why would they like to take a photograph with a terrorist? So what you understand, this is, all those who are speaking, they are not following the law of the country. The Malaysian police says, I am innocent. 
so they are more bothered about the indian police which is fabricating they are more indian than malaysian <laughs> they are willing more than the prime minister of india so what you have to do you have to continue your dawa and do it with hikma and inshallah inshallah we do it for sake of allah subhanahu wa taala so that we want all the human beings in the world as many as we can so that we get them on the straight path and make them closer to allah and the rasul hope that answers the question well the gentleman in the red shirt please assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my name is hilmi abdullah i'm lawyer by profession and i'm also a state assembly man for gochir constituency i and i i i will i, I will recite two verses from quran a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim waqtuluhum haythu wajadtumuhum uh, the meaning is uh, kill them waqtuluhum haythu wajadtumuhum wherever you find them and, and another ayah is uh, إذا لقيتم الذين كفروا، if you meet the unbelievers، فضربوا رقاب، strike their neck until. and this two ayah if uh, read by the non-Muslim they they will be frightened. Uh, they will uh, worried about Islam, Muslim. and uh, in Malaysia we got 30% population. among non muslim and our situation now we also got a minister from non muslim and uh they are, they are our enemy always uh, uh what we call uh repeating the the what we call uh repeating uh, negative ayah from quran to threaten the non muslim from supporting the islamic party uh, and i need your suggestion or advice how we as muslim to to face our dilemma because we we have the same population for the non muslim and one more question chairman first to answer this question then you can answer okay. we already asked two questions before i answer your question you repeated twice that the population of non muslim is 30% i don't know where you get a statistic from your uh, member of state assembly according to the statistics i read it is 27% muslims are 63% exactly malay the pure malay are 51 52% with all the other muslim indian muslim and other yamuni muslim all muslim put together it goes to 62 to 63% you no know, it makes a difference you are giving them 10% more so the brother will say that you are right you know you are increasing their population <laughs> but alhamdulillah but as you know that the most original malay the bumi putra most of them were muslims all the others came afterwards the original a muslim they came later on british have got them they came from china they came from india etc now coming to your question the verse that you quoted that wherever you find them you kill them and the second one that you strike them the first verse you quoted is from surah tauba chapter number 9 verse number 5 that wherever you find the kafir you kill him you tell him in malaysia number 1 How many, how many Muslims have killed the kafir here in Malaysia in all these years? Only because of this verse. Zero. Zero. The killings in Malaysia are done more by non-Muslims. If you go to the Home Ministry Department, I don't want to give the statistics here. There are only 15 percent of the Muslims are, are registered criminals. according to the home ministry department two years back today i'll have to refresh it 15% of the criminals that registered in the home ministry department if you go to the website and 15 majority 85% are non muslim 45% hindus chinese about 30% who says that not me home ministry department and you are a legislator so you should be able to speak in the council you should do your homework so the more killing and criminal activities done in malaysia by whom according to the home ministry department by whom if this verse was true this 27% non muslim would not have lived in malaysia correct right or wrong that means no one is implementing that verse as they think 
The right reply to this is you have to read the full verse in context. This verse of the Quran of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5, you have to read the context. For the context, you, you read from the starting of the surah. It speaks about a peace treaty between the Muslims of Muslims and the mushriks of Makkah. This peace treaty was broken unilaterally by the mushriks of Makkah. By the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, he is giving a warning. He says to the mushriks, put things straight in four months time, otherwise a declaration of war. They break the treaty. Now Allah is giving them a warning. To put things straight in four months time, otherwise a declaration of war. Then, verse number 5 speaks in Surah Tawbah. In the battlefield Allah is talking about. Wherever you find the enemies, kill them. Wait for them in every stratagem of war. Let them hear the verse. But after verse number 5, they jump to verse number 7. You know why? Verse number 6 has the reply to the query. Verse number 6 says that if the mushriks, if the kafir want asylum, don't just give it to them. Escort them to a place of security so that they hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here Quran is talking in a battlefield. In a battlefield, the army general, what will he say? When the enemies come, you run away. What will the army general say? In the battlefield, he will tell you, kill them. So this verse is revealed in a battlefield when the enemies break the treaty and when they come for the war. In the battlefield, wait for them in every stratagem of war and kill them wherever you find them. What is wrong in that? If Malaysia goes for war and if the enemies come, what will the army general of Malaysia say? When the enemies come, run away, he will say. But what the Quran says in the next verse of Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 6, is phenomenal. No army general will say that. The maximum the army general will say, okay, if the enemies won't let them run away. Here, Quran says, escort them to a place of security. That means if they want peace, if they want asylum, don't just let them go. Escort them so that they are secure. Now they are under your protection. This is Islam. Almost all the verses, even that verse, you could, I think it's from Anfal, or whichever verse it said. Most of the verses in the Quran which talk about Kital, the next verse says, peace is better. Even the other verse, peace is better. So all these verses are in the battlefield. Now in the battlefield, you have to boost the morale of the soldiers. So what is wrong? They are quoting out of context. If this was a normal time, then the non-Muslim would not live in the Muslim majority country. You know, India, we ruled, India ruled, Muslims ruled India for about thousand years. No non-Muslim would have been alive. This verse doesn't mean that. It's talking about when the kafir, non-Muslim, when they break the treaty and come to you for war, in the battlefield you have to attack them, you have to kill them. This is normal. Hope that answers the question, brother. Okay, I'd like to welcome once again Yamba Hormat. He's the Kelantan Assembly Assemblyman who'd like to pose another question. No, no. No problem. No. Okay, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Yamba Hormat. Yamba Hormat, let's again. Thank you, sir. As Islamic Party, our, one of our mission is to impose Islamic law in our country. From your personal opinion, uh, is it possible for us to impose Islamic law now? If, if the answer is negative, where is, when, when is uh, pro exact time, proper time to enforce Islamic law for our country? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question that he's asking, coming from the Islamic Party, that should we implement the Islamic law in the country? As per as the Quran, Islamic law should not be imp imposed in the country, it should be imposed in the full world. Inshallah. We are vice president of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Full world. Why only Malaysia? We can do or not do is secondary. Allah is the creator. As far as can we implement the Sharia here? Always you should understand that there is a procedure. There is a procedure that should be done. And anyone who has the basic knowledge of the Quran, basic, not in depth, if he's a practicing Muslim, he has to agree that Sharia is the best law. And here you have majority Muslim. So if 
The problem that may come here is implementing Sharia is the politics. If you keep politics aside, then implementing is possible. If you bring in politics, it's difficult. Because according to me, today's politics in most part of the world, not everywhere, but most part, it takes you away from Quran Sunnah, today's politics. The politics as was there at the time of the Khulfa Rashidin. If you see a Khalifa, mashallah, Tumar Adilawan, how he used to sleep on the floor, <clears throat> being the Khalifa of the Mominin, Amirul Mominin, how he used to implement how is to check anyone become the governor? He used to say, anyone become the governor? Before you govern, I will check your wealth. After you become governor, if your wealth is in excess, you give it to Baitul Mal. To his close relatives. To Khalid bin Walid, Radilawan, Khalid bin Walid, the sword of Allah. When he made him governor, and after he finished, he had excessive wealth. He did business. He didn't tell him that you lied. He didn't doubt his honesty. Not that he took bribe which today most politicians in the world take. But he said that if you want to become my governor, you have to lead the worldly affairs. He made in proper business. He said, no, you can only have so much excess in so many years. Balance, Baitul Mal. He was shocked. He felt so bad that when he heard that the close relative of Hazrat Umar, to him also he did the same, then he said, okay, this is his style of justice. Today, <laughs> Your bank balance may not show, but your balance of your relatives and friends go up. So what you have to understand that if you want to implement Islam or Sharia, first you have to agree that we belong to one party, Allah's party. Not by name, it is by deed. And all the Muslims should unite together. We should put our party differences aside. And if all Muslims unite together, putting a party difference in their life, it's possible. If we don't unite, it's not possible. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, Wa tasimu bihablillahi jamiya wala tafarakku. Hold fast to the rope of Allah, strongly and be not divided. And whenever I meet, whether politicians abroad, whether politicians in Malaysia, most of the parties, I tell them, let's come close to the Quran. And only way you can unite the Muslims of the Ummah, Muslims of this country, Muslims of the state, is on the basis of Quran. So we have to keep our differences aside. And for the bigger cause of the Muslim Ummah, if you unite, we'll be a stronger force, you may lose your seat. I mean, seat of position, no problem. You may get a seat in Jannah. The problem if you unite, then who will be the leader is the question. <laughs> So if you lose your seat in this world and secure a seat in Jannah, it's a very good bargain, deal. Correct? So the problem is if you unite, there can be only one leader. So the other leader should agree that we give up our position so that we get a position in Jannah. So if you have that faith that we are doing for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we unite and we don't bother about this seat but bother about the seat in Jannah, it will be a very good bargain, whether it's successful here or not, Akhirah, you're successful. So because today we find in the Muslim Ummah, not that the leaders don't know, they're knowledgeable, they're intelligent. Most of the Muslim country leaders, not that they're fools, but they have less faith in Allah, less faith in the Quran. So if you have faith in Allah and the Quran, one more thing, if you want to implement in a place where there are non-Muslims available, it's important that you explain to them the maqasid the sharia Let me give you one example. Like suppose you say that you want to implement Sharia in Klantan. Okay, Klantan, 96.2% are Muslims. Will be easy. But you want to in Malaysia, there are 28, 27% non-Muslims. Correct? So if you say that you want to implement the Sharia, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, as to the thief, be it a man or woman, chop off his hand. Chopping off the hands? Today in this age of science and technology, non-Muslims say it's a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless religion. But we have to explain to them the maqasid the Sharia. 
The reason the chopping of the hands is they as a deterrent. And most of the non-Muslims think that if you go to Saudi Arabia where this law is practiced, every second person will come across will have his hand chopped off. It's not so. I've been to Saudi Arabia maybe 50 to 100 times. I've not met a single person with his hand chopped off. It may be taking place, but it's not as common as you feel. What you have to make you understand the maqasid of Sharia is that there are more than 80 conditions to be fulfilled before you cut the hands. For example, if a million ringgit is kept on the stage and someone carries it with him, will his hand be chopped off? The answer is no. Million ringgit? No. Why? I'll tell you later on. Suppose someone robs bread, will his hand be chopped off? The answer is no. Who will be held responsible? Who is governing this state, this country? How can someone steal bread? It is the duty of the Khalifa of the state to see to it that everyone is fed. So if a person robs bread, who is held responsible? Who? Not the robber, the Khalifa. This is Islam. You can't chop off his hand. There are various conditions. If you keep one million ringgit, somebody robs. Who's responsible? Why did you keep it in the open? For cutting of the hands, that thing should be in lock and key. There are rules. 80 conditions, more than 80 conditions required. And if anyone is not fulfilled, you cannot chop that. You can give some other punishment. This is Islam. So maqasid sharia is as a deterrent. The Islamic sharia says, if someone commits adultery, what is the, what is the punishment? Had penalty put to throw into death. Correct? I want to ask you, how many people at the time of the Prophet were stoned to death? For that you require four witnesses. Correct? There is not a single case in the life history of the Prophet, except for a woman who volunteers herself. That I did zina, Prophet said go away. She comes back, I did zina, Prophet said go away. I did zina, okay, when the child comes, come back. After that, regularly when she pesters the Prophet, then the Prophet gives the penalty. And when people say and start cursing her, the Prophet says, her repentance, if it's distributed in Medina, would forgive all the people of Medina. I want to know in Saudi Arabia, how many people were killed because of adultery? I have met many of the judges. The maqasid of Sharia is that maybe a non-Muslim who's caught adultery and is brought to the court of law. The judge says, really adultery? He says, yes. The judge says, okay, lunchtime. Then the lawyer goes and tells, say you didn't do. Why? If you say you did, you'll be punished. If you say you don't do, you'll get less punishment. So maqasid of Sharia is as a deterrent. Why did Allah say that four witnesses? That means they're doing in public. That means they're doing in public and spoiling the society. If you see in the history, if you see the history of the Ummayyad, Abbas said, hardly four or five people may have been put to death in 100 years, 200 years. So people pick up this and portray Islam to be a religion of terror, of ruthlessness. No. I am asking you the question. In Islam, first it is you have to pay zakat. Every rich person who has a saving of more than two and a half percent. He was saving a more than Nisab level, should give two and a half percent of his wealth in charity. Every year, correct? After that, if someone robs, then chopping of the hands, after following all this, Makase the Sharia, I'm asking the question today, do you know the country which has the maximum rate of crime where? In USA. I'm asking you the question, if you implement this law in USA, every rich person who has a saving of more than Nisab level should give two and a half percent in charity every lunar year. After that, if anyone robs, you chop off the hand. Will the rate of robbery, theft, and crime in USA, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? Will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? Decrease. It's a practical law. That's the reason the least rate of crime anywhere in the world, Saudi Arabia. Not that the police is very intelligent. Not that they are very smart. Because they implement the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it acts more as a deterrent. There is a maqasid sharia. So, if you explain this to your non-Muslim, that why does Islam do this more as a deterrent? Ah! If they have all the tea proof, my hand will be chopped off. So surely he will not rob. In most of the other law, okay, you are caught. You can bribe someone. 
You go to jail, you come out after two months, after three months, no problem. When you are robbing two, three million ringgit and you are in jail for two, three months, no problem. But if you the two, three million ringgit chopping off that, he will not agree. The makas is the sharia. So this, if you have to implement, you have to educate the citizens of Malaysia. That the most practical law in the world. See where it is more practical. About hijab. About death penalty for a rapist. The maximum number of rape is in USA. Implement every woman should wear hijab. Man looks at a woman should lower his gaze. After that someone rapes death penalty. Will the rate of rape increase, decrease or will it remain the same? It will decrease. So for that you will have to talk. You will have to get people who know how to convey the message to non-Muslims. And then, inshallah, it will be possible. But first, you have to unite the Muslim. Without that, not possible. If you unite the Muslim, then if you, if you have the full majority on your side, and then explain to the non-Muslims, do you know, I do my research before settling in the city, the city which has the maximum number of crime in Southeast Asia, which city? Which city? Which? Dubai? Kuala Lumpur and Karachi, both of them compete. Karachi, we have heard. I was shocked. I was shocked that Kuala Lumpur is always number one or number two among the Southeast Asian cities. Maximum crime. What is the solution? Out of ten cities which maximum number of crime, four are in Malaysia. Penang, high rate. Where there is wealth, you'll find the thieves also. What is the solution? Maybe petty crime, whatever it is. What you have to understand, you have to make the people understand about the makase, the sharia. And then, if you talk about sharia, it will be acceptable. Otherwise, it will look more like a religion of terror, look like a religion of violence. So every, re every law in Islam has a logical reason for it. If you can explain that, people will love it and people will expect it. People accept it, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are about uh, five minutes to 12.45. And I was ordered by the uh, organizer to make a stop for this session at 12.45. So, may I go for the next last question from the lady's side, please? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Nignor Najiha. From, uh, I'm an internship student from Corporate Management Department. So, my question is um, What is your opinion from Islamic perspective about those who got employed from middlemen and they are not qualified for that job? So, this kind of situation is basically suppressed of those people who are more qualified and need that job. So, Doctor, I need your opinion about that. Thank you. If I understand the question correctly, that a person gets a job who is not qualified due to a middleman. So, is it correct? And people who are qualified don't get the job. Sister, first you have to understand that how did the middleman give him the job? If it's because of bribing, it's not accepted. It's haram. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188, that do not use your wealth as a bait for the judges in order to eat other people's wealth. It's haram. Maybe the middleman felt, okay, this person qualified, okay, he gets 80 marks, he gets 60 marks, but the 60 person marks has a more requirement of a job, he may be more poor, and if he does that as a favor, depending upon the reason, you can't give a blanket rule. There are options where the person in authority can go up and down without breaking the rules of Sharia. Taking bribe is haram. If he gives it because he's a relative, no. If he maybe is helping, okay, this person requires a job much more. If I don't give a job, his family will die. He has got 10 people in his family. There may be X, Y, Z reason. So he cannot give a blanket rule that, okay, fine, a middleman comes. So who is that middleman is important? Why did he do important? You have to make everything clear. If it by bribing, it is haram. If it is breaking any rule of the Sharia, it's haram. But if you don't break the rule, like many a times people come to us for a job and we don't have vacancy. We give him, okay, fine, work. And he's sitting full day doing nothing. What are we doing? We are helping, doing charity. Another person comes, okay, why didn't I get a job? Are, Baba, I gave charity to him. 
instead of giving money, he's sitting and doing nothing. You don't require a helper. We're keeping him. So you cannot come and tell me, oh, why didn't you take me? So the thing that who is in a position, he has a right to say yes or no. Like if you have an examination rule that so much percentage will get, if it's public, then they have to follow that rule. Then there are some trustees who can overrule. There are rules and regulation for everything. As long as they're not breaking the rule, as long as they're not breaking the Sharia, it's accepted. If you're breaking the rule of the Sharia and following the rule of the trust, the Sharia is more important. So if you break any rule of the Sharia, it is haram. If the Sharia permits you, and if that organization also permits you, it's permissible. Everything is not black and white. You have to understand the full reason and logic and then give the judgment. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zaki Knight. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the program. And if you still have more questions, I believe, inshallah, tomorrow night, please make sure every one of us, please bring all your families, all your friends to the stadium, Sultan Muhammad Keempat Kota Baru. It's going to be another big event tomorrow night at the stadium, beginning at 7 o'clock. And also tomorrow night uh, at 3 o'clock, we have an exclusive talk with the latest thoughts for be the, uh, with Farhat Night, inshallah, at the Kelantan Trade Centre. Okay, thank you very much once again to Dr. Zaki Knight for such a precious knowledge. With a limited time, we are here at the Dewan Jaman Utama, Qatar Naim. And may Allah, with His mercy, accept all our deeds, inshallah. And as the token of appreciation from the state government of Kelantan to our brother, Dr. Zaki Knight, I would like to welcome on stage Yang Berhormat Datuk Haji Muhammad Amar Abdullah, Deputy Chief Minister of Kelantan, to present a special memento to brother, Dr. Zaki Knight. Please welcome. Alhamdulillah, thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, tuan-tuan dan puan-puan, dimita duduk dahulu ya. Kita akan beri laluan kepada yang berhormat Datuk Timbalam Cipusat dan Dr. Zakir Naik serta pimpinan-pimpinan utama untuk keluar terlebih dahulu dan semua dimita terus berada di kursi. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much once again for joining us on this precious Lovely time for the executive talk with Dr. Zaki Knight and I adjourn this session with the recitation of Tasbih Kafara in Surah Al-Ans. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wal ansr innal insana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Thank you very much. So I'd like to invite the Honorable Dr. Zakir Knight and with Dr. Timalam Tiusa Kelantan and all the VIPs for the lunch station at the Dewan Jaman, Dewan Teratai. Please welcome. Kita bagi laluan eh, kepada pimpinan-pimpinan untuk terlebih dahulu keluar daripada Dewan menuju ke tempat makan dan semua hadirin juga dipersilakan untuk kejuman makan tengah hari di sebelah Anjong, Dewan Teratai. And as you are about to leave this hall, Please make sure everyone to visit the Inspiracy Mu'allaf. We have a special booth to raise funds for those Mu'allaf as well as Asnaf. So you can donate to them or simply purchase a t-shirt to support the project from the Inspiracy Mu'allaf. Thank you very much. Ah, siapa ada tertinggal telefon bimbit ya? Power bank, power bank, sorry.